Let me see. I'll turn okay. on this light here. <clears throat> Excellent, guys. While Sean is turning out, his, turning in or turning on, rather his light. Welcome to another break the rule stream. Today we are sowing discourse with Sean P. McCarthy. It is a great pleasure to uh, have you with us here. I'm a, a big fan of your podcast called Grub Stakers, but you're going to have to tell us, uh, well, let's start with that. What exactly does Grub Stakers mean? And then we are going to go through your whole thing about your origin story coming uh, to New York yeah. City from Seattle and uh, generally like how you got into the things that you got into. But let's first start with Grub Stakers. What does that mean? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm excited to come break the rules with you guys. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, pleasure is ours. And uh, Grub Stakers has been uh, a podcast around for about three years now. It's basically, the, the concept is biographies of billionaires. We'll give you a biography in about an hour, uh, maybe more, maybe less, if uh, we didn't do all the research properly. But um, the idea is essentially you can get kind of the, PR press piece, you know, they all have their PR teams. So if you want to like look up a CNN article about X billionaire, uh, you're going to find a lot of details in there that are always like flattering, always emphasizing their charitable givings and such. So we kind of approach giving you a billionaire biography as if it's written by a prosecutor. You know, we, we do tend to look for like the shitty things they did and try to like cover that. Uh, so it's it's a bit more hostile, but I do think it, it balances out considering like if you want the the more fair portrayal, well, you can get that from any cable news station or any newspaper. Um, so I, I think we've uh, we've done just over 200 episodes now, um, not all of them covering an individual billionaire, but most of them. So we've, we've got a little nice little audio encyclopedia of billionaires going. I really enjoyed your uh, Elon Musk episode, and uh, you did a uh, multi-parter uh, about Bill Gates. Yeah, I was listening to the Bill right. Gates one. Even within the first hour, I would say the the way that you've mapped out his various, like, literally born into various political connections, stuff that or normal people don't even know. Uh, but yet the story is that he was uh, some, like... Uh, middle class nerd that started in his parents' garage. Right. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> well, it's so, yeah. I mean, he's a smart guy, but it's just so funny, like him and Bezos and such. The, the fact that nobody, one in a million person, could have done what they did because, you know, Bezos infamously got like a $300,000 loan from his parents, who were some of the biggest, his family was some of the biggest landowners in Texas when he was mm -hmm. born. And Bill Gates, like his dad, was a high-powered Seattle attorney. He grew up with, um, I, I forget the exact figure, but it, like a million-dollar trust fund, basically. And he gets into Harvard. And it was just like he learned programming because he went to a private school where his parents could afford to get him computer time. It used to be when there were these big yeah, computers the, that took up. coding machines, yeah. Right, yeah. They took up a whole room. So if you were like a poor kid from a public school, you're not going to be able to learn how to program. But the, the rich kid who uh, went to the private school, he was able to get some coding time. And so he was able to take advantage of this, this new economy, which is I kind of, like I kind of think a, a point we cover in the podcast that I've made before is, you know, not all not all billionaires are dumb. Some of them are pretty smart. But what you find with every one of them is it's not something just anybody can do. You usually have to be born with some degree of advantage to to get to that place in your life. We have a comment, by the way, from Charles Kahn. Okay. Shout out to uh, Maz Bastard, who says, who are some of the smallest land owners in Texas? I'm not sure I understand the question, if it's in some some inside, uh, well, I don't know. Well, bigger in Texas. That's yeah. uh, oh, yes, there we go. That I makes own sense. A, I own a restroom and a gas station in Texas, so I think that qualifies. There just, you go. <laughs> and for you know, those who don't know... Five um, by five. <laughs> um, for those who don't know, what exactly is a grub staker? It's uh, basically the um, company store men in the uh, gold rush in America, or something to that effect. Yeah, it was, no. Uh, well, what what is that though? Uh, a company store man. Well, we were like, in terms of the name of the podcast, we were drafting a bunch of different stuff, and um, my co-host uh, Yogi Polywall, to his credit, was. He was thinking about uh, Google Analytics and stuff like you want people to be able to Google your podcast or, you know, find it based on the name, basically. 
And so we were just going through all these kind of like thesauruses and stuff for like something even tangentially to do with rich people. And then we came across Grubstaker, which was, you know, in um, uh, prospecting mining times, it was the person who would like front you money or equipment to go prospect, you know, go stake out a gold claim and on the condition that they get X percentage if you hit anything. And that's, you know, kind of like a modern venture capitalist basically could also be described as a grub staker. So we just took that name and, uh, you know, a lot of people thought it was about food. But um, at the time we started, if you Google grub stakers, it would just like show you a few restaurants in like flyover America. But fortunately, we have destroyed them in the Google analytics and <laughs> nobody will ever be able to to locate their food establishments again because the, the search results are dominated by a uh, podcast hosted by four jerk offs. Good. Well, Thank until God. the point that bug eating becomes the norm and then grub yes. staker is going to take off as a, I mean, what do you feel about that? Bug before... bug hug. <laughs> exactly. But before we get to that also, Brian O'Shea is here. He is a private detective. He is a uh, ex special forces. Although I don't know, like playboy playmates, there's no ex playmate. Can you be an ex uh, special forces or are you like always special forces in the inside? Well, um, thanks for having me back. Good to see you again. It's been a while. Um, so ex special forces intelligence. So to be clear, I was not a green beret. I was mm. one of these intelligence mm. guys in a green beret unit who carried a much heavier backpack, but got none of the glory. Uh, so um, in that respect, um, I think you always think like special forces. And by that, I mean, smarter, not harder. So, you know, big, you know, a, a big fix, a big fiction is that, you know, those guys are in the woods eating snakes. Well, that's, that's the Rangers. If, if we see a hotel in town, we'll either rent all the rooms or buy the hotel. So that's, <laughs> that, that was a big difference. But um, yeah, you always think that way. You're always thinking of ways, kind of like a hacker, you know, you're thinking of a way, okay, there's a barrier, go through it. Whether that's business, life, anything. I get very frustrated with people when they come to me and they're like, um, oh, I couldn't find this. And I'm like, where did you look? Did you look here? Did you look here? Like we just kind of keep going until we get it done, what needs to get done. So, but again, I don't want to belabor that. So it's good to be back. And sorry, is a little late. We are. Oh, driving. no worries at all. Doing the doing another road trip across the country, so we just drove across South Dakota and we're in Sioux Falls. Ooh, nice. Well, nice. it's always it's always great to have you back. And uh, when it comes to this curiosity, by the way, my apologies for the screen being a mini me screen for a second. This is the result of me pressing the wrong button in OBS, and I want to have the sewing discourse logo on display. If I'm not going to be able to figure out how to do this, I'm just going to switch back to uh, break the rules. But this goes to. Um, with uh, Brian, you are also interested in the various machinations of what's going on be behind the scenes. And uh, what I'm curious about with Sean is how did you decide to go into this particular line of uh, line of inqu inquisitory inquisitiveness? Like uh, Tim Dillon, I'd say, is the closest one that I could think of off the top of my head. I mean, Joe Rogan, too, to a certain extent. But... Uh, being people who are interested in going deep and finding out uh, how the sausage is made or how the fudge is packed. So, Sean, how did you get to being interested in this in the first place? Oh, and also, how did you start your stand-up career to begin with? Oh, yes. That's, yeah, Another... uh, yeah I, um, I started stand-up in Seattle. Um, I was just, you know, a kid watching the late-night shows like Conan and stuff, and uh, I really loved it. Um, so I started doing it out there, then I moved out to New York City, and uh, I met Tim Dillon out here. Um, did a lot of shows with him and, you know, I'm glad, uh, now that he's making one and a half million dollars a year, he finally has a budget, <laughs> uh, adequate to the lifestyle he desires, uh, <laughs> because, you know, I knew him when he was like, uh, making what he was doing bus tours. Yeah. So he's making yeah. like, tours, yeah. he was making dog walker money with, uh, you know, an <laughs> appetite for Roquefort steak. All of his well, life. it's his parents' fault because his parents took him out to really good restaurants and they developed this uh, aesthetic quality in Tim. So, uh, well, it ended up working out in the end, though. So I'm really happy for him. Oh, yeah, he's a, he's a great comic, great guy. Um, very funny. And, like, he's uh, interesting because, you know, as long as I've known him, he's been into conspiracy stuff. And, you know, for lack of a better term. And it's only in the last year or two years, really, that I re-examined conspiracy stuff because it was just one of those things where 
I kind of, for most of my political life, bought, you know, what do you want to call it, the, the Noam Chomsky perspective or the kind of general left anti-conspiracy perspective. And I think it was partly locked down, partly finally reading uh, this excellent book, Devil's Chessboard by David Talbot. But mm. I, um, and then most recently, um, coming across the works of Peter Dale Scott, who's uh, my hero. But, you know, most recently, I've, I've kind of redefined my thinking on conspiracy. And I think what it is, is like, essentially, people get this, this idea of like, what a conspiracy is and a secret team and, you know, a cabal controlling everything. But Peter Dale Scott is so good at um, explaining that He's, uh, of course, the person who, in the U.S. context, coined the term deep state all the way back in the 1970s. And um, uh, interestingly enough, this was he's a leftist. This was mostly ignored by the left, but eventually taken up by the, the Trump and the MAGA people. But, you know, when he talks about a deep state, it's essentially the idea that there is, as long as there is a national security state, a classification system, there is going to be a documented history of government of this country that is inaccessible to the public. And a lot of people would argue that this classified history of the United States is actually, there are more documents in it. It's, it's more detailed and in-depth than the actual uh, public history. So it's just like there's, there is no way around it that there is this kind of dark matter when you want to understand U.S. history or global history since World War II, there is this dark matter of the intelligence agencies, um, the national security state, and everything they've just slapped a, a classified label on and, and stuck in a shelf. So what Peter Dale Scott and uh, many others have done so well is you're trying to like, you know, it is just like trying to piece back together the elephant you know, the blind man and the elephant parable, you're, you're trying to figure out like what is below the surface. And, and Peter Dale Scott does it with, you know, looking through the various people's memoirs, looking at, you know, public disclosures, declassified documents, and just trying to, to shape this incomplete puzzle and, and tell some sort of narrative about what the national security deep state is doing parallel to the, um, the main uh, public face of government. And that's just an area that I've only recently gotten into but i find infinitely fascinating and i think it once you have some handle on it i think it shapes your understanding of current events uh, to a degree that i didn't feel as comfortable and as knowledgeable before i i started looking into and, and trying to understand it and i think it is like the absolute essential post-world war ii history for anybody who's interested in history oh well, that's that's very fascinating that you're into peter dale scott because he was originally canadian um, mm -hmm. and I'm here in, uh, near Niagara Falls, the Canadian side. Um, he went to McGill and he, he was originally a poet. Um, so he was involved in like a lot of the lefty, like new, new, uh, new left type of movements, but then he wrote books such as, um, I think the first one that you've read was, what was it called? Deep politics and JFK. I think mm -hmm. that was the one uh, I read, uh, drugs, oil, and war which was about Afghanistan and how he was one of the first ones at the forefront to conclude that the quote unquote deep state and the intelligence agencies were using Afghanistan as a bulwark to sort of fund black operations, all going all the way back in the golden triangle uh, to like at least the mid eighties, maybe earlier with Iran Contra. So that's, uh, but, but what I wanted to ask you though, is about this connection between your previous Chomsky and view which is pretty much the standard among, I would say, without getting too like meta, uh, let's say like dirtbag, uh, like ironist left thinking about systems, as opposed to like conspiracy theory, which is more predominantly like the thinking of, let's call it the political right. So mm -hmm. how, how I, and I also want to get Brown O'Shea, who is, who was a glow in the dark, apparently. Um, <laughs> so um, how do you like link these two contradictory sort of views about the nature of power in the modern world? Well, it is interesting. I mean, you know, there's this uh, famous phrase that comes from CIA agent Cord Meyer, who was set up in the uh, 50s and 60s um, to essentially run the CIA propaganda in Europe um, throughout that time period and, you know, fund various cultural journals and outlets and all this. And he has this phrase, the compatible left. 
the left that is compatible with whatever the CIA is doing. You're not going to mm-hmm. agree with them 100 percent of the time, but they're not a threat. You know, it, it used to be the anti-Soviet left. Um, I would argue that it has now become the identity politics left. But um, yeah. but it is like one of those things where now that I've entered the conspiracy mindset, I can't help but look at the fact that, you know, Noam Chomsky and um, Howard Zinn, among others, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The, these are uh, people who I think have done some excellent work, but I also look specifically at what they have done on the JFK assassination and, yes, the September 11th attacks, and you just can't help but notice it's like when let's say National Review needs a leftist boogeyman, they pull up Noam Chomsky. You know, they've never they've never mentioned yeah. Michael Parenti as long as they've existed. And Peter Dale Scott, I never even heard of until like a year and a half ago. I saw him in this great documentary, Counterintelligence, and I was really won over. But, you know, I'm not a stupid guy. I've been reading about politics most of my life, and I'd never heard of this guy. And he's brilliant, you know, absolutely on the same level as Chomsky. And so I think it is just something where there's a media consensus uh, with the New York Times and, um, you know, all these Washington Post, uh, the established the nation and then establishment outlets on the right and such, where there are like leftists who are just or I shouldn't even say leftists. Let's say people on the margins. Yeah, yeah. People on the margins of, of politics who are just not allowed in the discussion where you're allowed to like attack Chomsky you're allowed to attack Howard Zinn. But there are just people who get the radio silence treatment because the ideas they're expressing are cannot be debated within the system on a regular basis because they ask they 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 draw too many inconvenient questions and they point at um, too much important stuff, basically. I want also and, want to get to from Brian as well. Um, Brian, do you agree with uh, what Sean is saying so far about these people that don't really get the uh, time of day from uh, most organizations? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, and I was listening uh, to what you were saying. I, I think that changes with each uh, crisis, hmm. and so the current crisis we could get into or we can. It's up to you, but. Is a lot different. No, it's more up to the YouTube algorithm than anything else. So yeah. you tell me. You've <laughs> had plenty be, of experience. Let's use code words. That's pretty I'll much. I'll be careful. Um, yeah. I'll just use code words like like Faust and stuff like that. You'll figure out what I'm talking about. Um, but the um, so I'll talk about the current situation. What I've noticed about the current situation is there's I think the way the establishment, for lack of a better term, has handled uh, free speech is going to lead to a whole new generation of people digging for conspiracies because we've seen of late, for instance, uh, a certain bug came from a certain place and that was laughed out of town and everyone was conspiracy theorists. Well, now there's hearings and now that doesn't seem to be going away. I've always thought that. It just fit into my whole Occam's razor of the world view. Um, and I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Just, hey, made a mistake, let's try to fix it, was what I thought the next press release would be. What really piqued my interest was how uh, almost viciously people were cast as, not only cast as conspiracy theorists, but this bundling of things where, like, if you don't agree with us, you are a Trumper, which means you are a white supremacist, which means you you know, hate anyone that doesn't look like you. And it's kind of like I look at a conspiracy theory and we just used to call those uh, competing hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And so where it's been, so back to the original question, uh, do I agree um, with that? I mean, he he covered a lot, so that's a lot to unpack. Mm -hmm. But by and large, yeah, I mean, I see where, you know, really the, the root of it comes from, you know, the entire... Um, conspiracy feel. I think it's been weaponized now. Um, but for me as an investigator, and I put this out to my uh, my hashtag citizen detectives, which I've kind of rallied quite a few people doing this. I-, I love it when I hear something called a conspiracy theory, especially in the last year. That's what I start researching. And I would say 100% of the time that I've looked at these things and people I'm close to have looked at these things. They've turned out to be true. We can't prove they're true right now, 
but I do it by following the money and the money always tells the truth. Hmm. Well, that's another there thing is... that Sean covers as well about like the fact that like you have a cabal of essentially billionaires and people working within the deep state that more or less are giving money to the, all of the like name choice media brands, be it the New York times, New Yorker, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, basically every media outlet around New York or Washington, that's pretty much the, uh, the, the propaganda funding beltway. Um, and so that it's, it's almost mind boggling when you actually do like yeah. go through the work and all those connections. Right? But when, when has this not been the case though? This is what I'm interested. If we look back at yellow journalism, people have always had their hands in the pie to a certain extent. And I bet that if we look back, journalists were looked at uh, pretty closely to what they're looked at uh, today. Sure. Maybe you could say people were more asleep back then uh, in the 90s because everybody was partying, you know. It was kind of like a, a good time to be alive, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, oh, go Sean, ahead. We're, 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 I'm yeah. just curious. Like, yeah, do you think that uh, the media has changed to a certain extent, has become more activistic, or is this just something that uh, has always been around and only now we're paying attention to it, to this uh, gatekeeping? But it's not like we can go to any particular point in history and say this was a lot better than today, or can we? I think there are periods that were better than today. I think you're right that it's always had this problem. But I think, you know, to, to tie into the conspiracy thing where kind of the, the viciousness with, wi with which people are now treated if they deviate from X official um, doctrine, I mean, I, I think there's a few factors at work here. I think I look at uh, what's commonly called the neoliberal turn and, you know, the 1980s are really starting with Jimmy Carter and kind of what's happened to, um, in particular, real wages for people without college degrees, depending on the stat you want to use, they're down between 12 and 24 percent from 1978, real wages for somebody working without a college degree. So that's like a massive contraction in real wages for still two thirds of the U.S. population has no college degree. Um, so you have this contraction in wages, you have the deaths of despair. Uh, which have, you know, almost tripled since 1996, you know, and that's even just um, pre-COVID is a half a million people a year or no, 150,000, excuse me, uh, die these deaths of despair, suicide, drug overdose, alcoholism. And, you know, those, th that, those kinds of numbers don't triple unless you've really destroyed the population. You see the same thing in Russia in the 90s after the collapse of the Soviet Union, where we've been going through the exact same phenomenon in slow motion. And, in my opinion, the cause of that is the outsourcing of manufacturing primarily to China, primarily with uh, China's admission to the WTO. You see from 2000 to 2007, this is before the financial crisis, about 20% of all U.S. manufacturing jobs just totally disappear after China joins the WTO. And what this does is if you have a high school degree um, or you're a high school dropout, you used to be able to get like a decent manufacturing job in a union that paid your bills and lets you raise a family. And now you just can't. And then, you know, 20, and then those people, they're all in retail or they're forced to work in a grocery store or drive Uber or whatever. So it pushes those wages down too. So you just have like this, this, this real collapse. And why this all ties back to conspiracy is I'm a materialist. I think uh, the ideologies that people subscribe to, I think, are primarily defined by their material conditions. So I always point to, like, the John Birch Society in, you know, the 50s and 60s, this radical right-wing conspiracy group that thought President Eisenhower was a communist, communist subversive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like you always had this QAnon stuff, but the difference was this was the peak of the U.S. middle class, the peak of prosperity. This was a fringe element. Whereas now you have this same kind of stuff with QAnon. It's very similar to the Birch Society. However, you have it in a period of 40 straight years of contraction for most Americans. So that's why you have a new poll that says 15% of the population believes in QAnon in the United States. That's comparable to, to a mainstream religion. So you do have this proliferation of conspiracy, this... Um, degradation of the standard of living and this is also why it all comes back to the the nastiness that we were mentioning earlier because you know the system to kind of keep itself going it runs through different playbooks 
you know, throw stuff at the wall and see what, what sticks. And I think one of them is dividing the population against each other because there is, you know, a very small ruling elite that controls this entire country and controls, you know, uh, that are responsible for the problem. Let's say, you know, you could say top 20%, you could say top 10%, whatever you want to say. But, uh, if they can just get, you know, every Republican and Democrat screaming at each other and saying, you're the problem, you caused this because you voted for Trump or Biden or whatever, instead of just focusing on this very small group that controls the vast majority of the wealth in society, that's good for them. And I think that's partly why you see stuff like, you know, let's say the 1619 project or even to talk about yeah. Howard Zinn. I think he he, he later kind of recanted on JFK assassination and said he thought the CIA probably did it. But to my knowledge, that book that he did, People's History, is actually taught in U.S. schools, you know, yes, the is. public it school is, system. Yeah. And it's like, well, if it was actually that much of a threat to it, the system, it probably would not be. And I think there are these, what there are like, there are particular ways of thinking from the right and from the left, which are promoted because they generate this kind of conflict and this like fake boxing match and keep people screaming at each other instead of focusing on the, uh, the top 10% or 20% wealthiest individuals. No, that's, there's a, co yeah, oh, go ahead, there's a couple of things I wanted to uh, unpack here that you were talking about. One of those things, uh, well, I'm going to get back to that a little bit later. It has to do with perception. But uh, the other thing is when you have all of these uh, millionaires and billionaires, like Bernie Sanders likes to say, mm -hmm. who uh, hoard all of this uh, wealth that's been going on. Millionaires you know, and billion well, well, like exactly. you can do the accent better than me. Like. Oh, I don't, I don't think so. What, what, are you, what are you implying? What are you implying? Well, anyway. <laughs> He's saying what, you're what more anti-Semitic than he is. It's, yes, well, exactly. very true. Is <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, anyway. What, what I'm curious about here is a couple of things. My mind's a little bit scrambled here because you did uh, talk about a lot of very important things. One of these is how much can we differentiate the progression of time and technology and people adopting uh, the best decision they could possibly adopt while still maybe filling up their pockets a little bit, but nothing too outrageous, th things that have been done throughout history, versus something that somebody can point to and say, hey, if I make as president an executive order to change A, B, and C, then we are going to have prosperity like nobody's business. You know, like certain acts that have been passed, certain things that was not a matter of just, well, companies decided it was in their best interest to go for yada, 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 but something mm. more akin to a very big transfer of wealth. And the second thing that I want to touch on when you were talking about these uh, people who, uh, let's say, uh, come out come out of the woodwork and uh, talk about uh, you know t talk about things, but people don't really want to associate with them. We have had at least as I was looking up uh, Hollywood movies and movies in general about the Iran Contra scandal, about mm. things that the CIA would rather keep hush hush. So it's still different than let's say having a. Uh, certain uh, a certain kind of dictatorship like i always like talking about here to uh, geo's detestment and uh, where people would actually get arrested for posting these things and uh, spreading out information that would be contrary to the government's interest so at least as somebody who came here from russia as a proud american this gives me a little bit more security and it is kind of like yuri bismenov was talking about regarding uh you know how here in america jane fonda can uh, go on tv and criticize the pentagon all she wants and he was saying like these are freedoms that we don't want to be taken away from us he was making the point that slowly through communist subversion they will be taken away from us and maybe you could say that this is also what's happening here but i just wanted to touch on i know i said c kind of a lot here but i want to touch on these uh these points well i would um make two points the first is uh, something i learned doing uh, my podcast grub stakers subscribe on patreon uh something i learned doing that is that in the mid 1980s there was actually a book written an entire book written about the monopoly on media in the united states and this book made the point that approximately at this time about 30 companies controlled 90 percent of all media in the united states well today four. wouldn't you know it we're down to five companies Technically five four that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right. So like four. So you've since the 80s had a massive 
massive shrinkage in the amount of uh, companies that actually control all media that people see in the United States. And kind of what has happened is if you actually go back, you know, you're talking about movies made about Iran Contra and such. If you actually go back on YouTube, you can find NBC News or CBS News on like BCCI, Bank of Credit and Commerce and, you know, CIA drug trafficking. And, you know, there were actually like mainstream corporate media reporting that was very adversarial against the CIA. It was never even common. trafficking of children. There's documentaries yeah. in the 80s and 90s about that. too. Right. So. Yeah, it was never common. It was never like the main thing you would see. It would still be mostly, you know, propaganda, but it, stuff would kind of sneak its way in there. There was more competition. If you couldn't get it on one network, maybe you could get it on another. And what we've seen since this consolidation, and this was actually done by Bill Clinton in the, I believe the 96 Telecom Act is really what did this. Since this consolidation, adversarial reporting about the national security state has disappeared like you just do not you know like it's amazing to me how you know worshipful most mainstream media acts towards you know cia uh, fbi etc cetera, etc cetera, especially the trump era and uh, you know so essentially and oliver stones made the point that you probably couldn't make jfk today made in 1991 so i think you do have this this real consolidation of media that has kind of has created a, a climate of censorship of corporate censorship that didn't exist previously. And, you know, when we talk about these these freedoms that we do value as Americans, and I do, I, I, I'm very, I think freedom of speech, the First Amendment is, is one of the greatest things uh, in this country. And I'm a very strong believer in it, very strong believer in, in free debate, free assembly. But I think what you're kind of seeing right now is as we talk about this 40 years of contraction, as you continue on that path, as you continue to stamp down on people, you do see these like small little embers of resistance. And yeah, 15 percent of the population thinking the government is is run by satanic pedophiles is a pretty good <laughs> indication that there are little burning embers of resistance to what this government has been doing. So you have a choice there if your population is starting to kind of rebel a little bit. And it's either you grant them these things they are asking for economically. You grant them a def decent uh, standard of living. You redistribute some wealth. You, you know, do an FDR New Deal, something like that, or you suppress them. And for now, it seems like we're, we're going towards the suppression. And essentially, like, what we have to realize is that the freedom of speech, freedom of assembly – these are not really compatible with an oppressive government that is actively trying to kill you. And so they're going to try to limit that. And that's what, you know, the disinformation crackdown on social media is all about. They're just going to ban anybody who like, you know, question. I, I'm not expecting to have an account on the 20th anniversary of 9-11 on Twitter. I think they're going to oh. do a big, I think they're going to do a big crackdown before that, but I think they're just going to keep kind of like, slowly banning more and more people and just shutting them off these social media platforms and saying, you know, oh, it's dangerous QAnon stuff when you post that picture of, of Bill Clinton getting a massage from that Jeffrey Epstein girl. So I think they're going to do mm -hmm. that. But I think at the same time, why they're pushing so hard for this domestic terrorism law is because, you know, they explicitly say it. They, they track, you know, these uh, various fringe groups and those fringe groups will be very careful to stay within the law. They're not doing anything violent. They just have political beliefs, uh, but they're not breaking any laws. So the FBI Agents Association and all these people who are calling for a new domestic terrorism law after the January 6th uh, riot, they're essentially just looking for the U.S. version of the Soviet Union's terrorism law, where if you are a political dissident, you are going to be charged with terrorism. You're going to be charged with, uh, oh, you're friends and hang out with like this person who believes in QAnon. You're in, a, in a, a terrorist group with them conspiring. And this is just like, you know, a lot of Americans don't realize now, it. Now, but, how, uh, how many people are doing this, though, in the in the government? How many people truly and honestly want to enact this kind of uh, law? Is it people who are more along the Nancy Pelosi wing? Is it people who are more along the AOC wing? I would say it's the entire Democratic Party. Oh, sorry to jump in there, but no, go for it. Um, what I've seen since, uh, what I have seen since, hold on, sorry. And by the way, everybody, subscribe right now. And also, if anybody 
has not retweeted yet, retweet it. Retweet this uh, tweet. And lastly, if all the people who are watching this share the Twitter post that I'm about to share in the chat, if you share that Twitter post, it's going to help us give more, get more people to watch this. Mm -hmm. So please do that. I am going to share the Twitter post in the chat right now. Anyway, Brian, go for it. Oh, so what I was saying is what I've seen, you know, since the start of this, I mean, since the start of this pandemic, um, you know, my my own wife was saying from the get go, they're never letting us out. Mm. And I I thought that was not really feasible. But, you know, it turns out like they're holding on to this pandemic as long as they can. And, and the numbers aren't lying. I mean, infections are down. Uh, even vaccinations are down and the numbers are going down, but they don't, they're, they're the, the Democrats mainly, and I'm, I'm neither, just so you guys know, I'm a libertarian, but they are pushing um, this, you, you've got to get vaccinated if you have natural immunity, which in, uh, for my research, I've never seen that ever with the virus um you that's why i'm usually, not going to take it to tell you the truth i mean yeah you know and that's and that's and that's every and that's that's another thing you know, that's a, that should be everyone's choice you know but what what i really see with all of this like going back to the this domestic terrorism thing you i you i always have to look at things tactically but then strategically and if you see what's happening with that all of a sudden these white supremacy groups which for my money, I've never actually physically seen one, or maybe I did, I didn't know they were. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, this is the greatest threat to national security. And it, it just seems ludicrous to me. And they, I'll, they, I'll just say and, one thing. Go ahead. They did, and, this, uh, they did this in the 90s also, though. So like this is which, this was Clinton with era. the white supremacists? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. I, I don't remember that. Can, can you... Yeah, well, that was that, that was the whole that was that. that was like the Branch Davidians, the Ruby Ridge stuff, uh, and then, right, like, right, then right, it right. turned out, yeah, even all a that certain was someone that was a certain veteran that did a certain thing at a certain Murrah building, mm -hmm. he was also had connections to these groups, and he had connections to intelligence agencies. So, mm. well, yeah, but also, well, uh, but also, Sh Sean, your surname is McCarthy, like uh, Joe McCarthy, who went after the uh, communists that were infiltrating uh, JFK's administration at the time. Mm -hmm. Since you were talking about uh, JFK earlier, not JFK, what am I talking about? FDR, my apologies, FDR, <laughs> yes, FDR is the Although JFK. It been useful. <laughs> hey, love, could, yes. I just, could I just finish the sure. point just oh, before yeah, go we for it. Go, go too for far? It. So, the point I'm making is what I see is. They need a crisis, okay? Who's ever in power? Yeah. I don't even want to. They need a crisis, and that crisis is to push through spending, plain and simple, hmm. okay? So, for instance, this infrastructure bill, if you really look at this infrastructure bill, it is just so full of pork. It just makes the last bill they passed, which was full of pork, uh, you know, seem like a, a lean cuisine. So <laughs> what, <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm seeing is they're lying, the, the people in power... And I won't even say Democrats or Republicans because it, it takes them both. And what I'm seeing is they're lining up, you know, crisis B, crisis C, climate, you know, is another one that seems like it's being set up to be the next crisis. Um, now we have the Delta variant, um, which, of course, was discovered by the Chinese Communist Party and everyone's just sinking their teeth into it, which is also politically correct. I noticed that they called it the Delta variant and didn't name it after a country. This yeah, Canadian hmm. media is going nuts over it, too. That's, that's yeah. right when and, we're just about to get it a lockdown. That's what happens. Yeah. So what I, I'll, I'll end this by saying quite simply, when I see these things, when all of a sudden I see this, you know, you know, this is this is the greatest threat to domestic, you know, security. I, I go to the source and it takes a while. And what I found is the first people to designate uh, white and don't get me wrong, hate white supremacists in every form or, or any racist in any form. But the thing about it is, is that the biggest threat to our country? I don't think hmm. so. And I did notice the first uh, group and I could be wrong, but the first group that I could find that named um, white supremacy the biggest threat, the biggest domestic threat, was a group owned by Henry Kissinger hmm. and mm. uh, called uh, CSIS, which I thank you, Wayback Machine, wasn't really a big deal, um, you know, pre-December. And then all of a sudden it's the biggest thing. 
And then at the same time, you see these things creeping up, like all of a sudden climate change, where you've got to get, um, you know, more windmills, more solar. Well, who makes those? Uh, Mm. By and large, the Chinese Communist Party, and I say Chinese Communist Party because it is the law in China. Every business has to have a party member or so many party members on their board. And early in the pandemic, when I went and I found something called Cash, which is the Chinese Academy of Sciences holdings, um, I noticed that a guy named Wu Levin is buying methane in uh, Washington, uh, Port of Kalama, Port of Seattle. That's a real thing. And one of the holdings companies, I'm not saying this is like some grand plan. I don't believe in the deep state. I just believe in groups of People want to make money who are all moving in the same direction. Um, But one of the companies that was making solar panels was actually called Corona. And I was like, well, that was probably a bad idea for a name, but no one thought of that. But the point is, when I see any of like these crises all of a sudden just pop out of nowhere. And when I see that right away, I'm like, okay, who who's going to profit from it? Who's going to profit from it? It's security that's, theater. Yeah, that's the. It really. But is. it also, but it also goes back to whether we're talking never let a good crisis go to waste, as that uh, quote goes, or mm-hmm. if we're talking about something intentional. And this is the third uh, thing that I want to ask Sean uh, regarding a lot of these uh, various conspiracies. Well, what I want to ask we, in specific. Well, re- real, real quick oh, though, ahead, I just want to. What can we extract as far as something that's tangible? where somebody says, this is the plan that I am outlining for humanity, where people are going to uh, suffer, they're going to be enslaved, not in those words maybe, but still, certain official documents, certain thought pieces by people who are very influential, and how can we distinguish them from, let's say, for example, with the Great Reset, one of the things that I kept hearing from a lot of people uh, who were more involved in and you could say, oh, they're just making it up, whatever. Their consensus is that a lot of these people at Davos, they're hucksters in their own way. They're shills mm-hmm. in their own way. They want to, they like being respected and wearing the Mortal Kombat outfits, and they like this <laughs> idea that, oh, I'm going to change the world, but a lot of it is, according to them, at least just a uh, puffing up of the feathers so that their organization makes more money and it's mm. all just a big shell game as opposed to so, so I want to see what can we extract that is not that that we can bring to any mainstream expert and be like okay mainstream expert this person who is well respected has this document which is just the worst thing in the world here it is in black and white <sighs> Well, uh, a couple points. And, you know, just to go back to the domestic terrorism thing real quick and white supremacy in the 90s. I mean, I look at all this stuff on a structural basis. And so when we talk about the military industrial complex, that is a real thing. There's, you know, a network of, of businesses, private businesses, weapons contractors who make a ton of money off of war. These are, you know, at this point, all owned by Black Rock and shit. So this is all Wall Street. They make a ton of money off of this. And then, you know, if you're a general in the military, well, you can go revolving door, get a fat payout from them. So you want to keep them happy. You know, if you're an ex government division that interfaces with whatever weapons contractor, you can get a great job. You you can make a lot of money. So that's this this network of private business and the national security state is the military industrial complex. And, you know, they want to keep the gravy train rolling. They've had a great thing since the end of World War Two. Um, because, you know, they had the uh, the Cold War, the Soviet threat. They could always uh, cook up a fake analysis that uh, pretended that the Soviet Union was far stronger than it actually was, which is what the CIA yeah. did with the Team B report um, in the 70s, you know, said like, oh, we've been vastly underestimating the power of the Soviet Union. We need a, a massive increase in the defense budget now. And that was all bullshit, but the people got paid. And the Soviets Um, didn't mind people thinking that as well. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, of course, the Soviet Union collapses in 91. And then there was all this talk at the time about a a quote unquote peace dividend, which was the idea that Americans had been paying higher taxes to fund the Cold War for decades. So now the Cold War is over. You know, the Soviet Union is gone. 
So the peace dividend was the idea promised in the 90s that we're going to give some of that money back to Americans. We're going to invest. And then it disappears. There was no peace dividend. You didn't get any of the money back. The defense budget never went down because they kind of, after the Soviet Union was gone, they groped around in the dark for a new threat. And in the 90s, it was, like we were saying, the white supremacists. And then, of course, you get 9-11. And 9-11, it's Muslim terrorism. And Muslim terrorism has kind of, as far as the American public is concerned, burned itself out. You know, people, they want to leave Afghanistan. They want to leave the Middle East. They, they, they're done with it. So that's kind of like, the, the reheating of white supremacism is this is how you sell terrorism to Democrats and liberals. This is how, you know, the FBI and DHS, they all get their funding and, you know, the military can, they can get some of that as well. So that's like, in terms of a structural analysis of what's happening, I just kind of follow what the actual incentives of the military uh, industrial complex are and, and try to trace that out. And I, I, I don't think I answered your entire question there, but well, the, please the add. about the document. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the works of Carol Quigley, um, Tragedy, oh, and yeah. Hope. Tragedy and Hope. To me, yeah. that would be probably a smoking gun. But also, I want to ask around the panel. So, first, you, uh, Sean, then Brian, then Jake. Um, do you think that the 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 cue is real? Or is it a total glow-in-the-dark operation that has uh, been used to justify the agenda? Or do you think it's like kind of both? Because we all know that certain organizations police the, the chans, quote-unquote. Hmm. So what, what is your opinions on this? And of course, Brian, you've actually worked in intelligence and disinformation. So I'm curious to hear your opinion on this as well. But Sean, you go first. And then uh, what, what, what is your general yeah. thoughts about Q? Yeah, my thought is it's probably a mix. Um, Robbie Martin, journalist with Media Roots Radio, he's done some really great, he's on Twitter, done some really great uh, research on QAnon and um, kind of, uh, let's say, intelligence links to dissemination and, and this and that. You know, like I always, I always find it kind of suspicious when, when QAnon is like promoting the Chinese Communist Party as being behind everything. I think that's maybe, <laughs> maybe the, maybe that has something to do with, you know, all this talk about a military buildup against China that you know, Tucker Carlson and everybody's always going on about. Um, maybe that's the next thing that they'll, they'll go for after the, the white supremacists. But I do, but I do think it's a mix of, maybe it started out as like, uh, I don't know exactly how it started out. Maybe it started out as a hoax, but clearly at some point, uh, intelligence became involved in it and tried to shape it and push it um, in their de desired direction. And uh, Brian, is it a like was it Donald Trump's butler or was it like just a total <laughs> like what do you from your research what do you think of the Q phenomenon or well, is it some kind of like weird Baudrillardian hyper reality thing? Uh, go ahead. I mean, to be fair, it's like I you know I didn't really learn about QAnon until ironically uh, I heard it from Democrats. So, uh, you know, I, I never, I, I, I kind of like I, how kids learn about drugs from having an anti-drug PSA come over. Right. You know, exactly. School. You know, the and so program. I, uh, I didn't really know much about it and I, you know, I didn't want to go to it um, just cause I'm, I'm too busy, but um, so I, I don't really know, but what I, I have seen though, what I have followed through with the way QAnon is now being used is, and, let, let's talk about China, because I do believe, um, and this is not from QAnon, this is from, you know, fact-based research, just following the money. I believe a vast majority of problems go back to the Chinese Communist Party. Absolutely. Like, for instance, a lot of people don't know, and I posted the link that, you know, why does the media seem so slanted, um, you know, in favor of China? Maybe it's because Net, which is state-controlled media, signed a memorandum of, of cooperation with them in 2018, which is on the link. It's from Xinhua Net, and there were hearings about this. NBC did it in 2015. Wait, wait who was um, this guy who uh, signed the memorandum with them? The Associated Press. Whoa, um, oh, uh, there you go right there. That's a pretty that's big guy. Xinhuan. That's, a, that's Xinhua Net really um, excited about it and putting out press releases, and it's a real thing. Um, or the fact that Disney... Um, was largely uh, invested in by members of the Chinese Communist Party so they could get their big parks into China. And then they, Disney turned around and bought National Geographic from Fox 
So now all of a sudden you see the soft propaganda coming in with a lot of panda bear stories. And so the thing is, it's, it's very real and it really does go back to um, you, you, if someone is telling you something is a conspiracy, what they do now is they'll take real things and throw them onto QAnon uh, meat grinder. And now, now they're crazy things. So like certain laptops, for instance, well, now we all know that's a real thing that exists. Mm. He, oh, apparently you know, he said certain words on the, that laptop. That, sure, you know. Oh, it's way for summer now. So that's. I mean, I'm old <laughs> enough to remember when that was a QAnon theory of yeah. its actual existence, and it was he himself that admitted to the existence of it. So I think QAnon is being. I don't. So I can, I'm not really answering your question, but I think it is a convenient meat grinder where, oh crap, some of these netizens or politicians are getting too close. Um, Let's let's call it QAnon. I, we saw that with Rand Paul's first hearing uh, with Fauci, and the I don't know her name, but the senator that went right after Rand Paul, um, basically said, "Okay, don't you find it to be a distraction with Rand Paul's crazy conspiracy theories?" And you know, I don't know. She said QAnon, but that that was implied. Hmm. But if you look, it's like you had a certain doctor. I don't want to get Lev kicked off. <laughs> I Thank apologize. you. I appreciate it. Uh, a certain dentist. No, don't want to confuse us. So we, we know who we're talking about. No, he, he that person actually said, um, no, there was no um, money going in a certain direction. I myself and many others before me, um, you know, found the resume of the guy in question who was receiving those funds who had them listed on his resume. Mm. It was a real resume from his university. My wife posted that video and then she read a uh, press release from the state senator. She's off Twitter for good now. Oh, I was going to mention that. Your wife actually got kicked out. I can't believe that. Being on the inside of that. um, And and by the way, uh, your wife is Naomi Wolf, for those who uh, don't know. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah. Well, congratulations on getting getting banned before I did. (laughs) <laughs> uh, look, it's you know thank you for saying that and i will because i told her i said hey you know what that means that means you were over the target it also yes. means you know you just made history and so the thing about that is what's seeing that from the inside and seeing the way the press has covered that they're saying things she tweeted that are so out of context but how do you how do you prove it all the tweets are gone and hmm. so and it's just this if you see the volume of media, you know, to smear her, I mean, any common sense person has to be thinking, okay, why are they putting so much effort into this? You know, why is this happening? And in my opinion, I I think it's because she sat at that table. She was a White House advisor. Uh, She's married to me. I've sat at different types of tables. And I think that was scary for them. And it came right on the heels of, um, hey, the emails are not going away. And so prior to that banning, um, the press was focused on, hey, let's reflect on the great work someone did for HIV. It's like, hmm. what? Oh, by the yeah. way, that great work. Don't research what this for certain doctor did in the 80s, but in the early 90s, when it came to a certain drug with uh, that particular disease. OK, so Do love now research? if you get banned, I'm blaming him. I'm, I'm blaming you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. um, <laughs> oh, I didn't boy. mention his name. But by the okay. way, I, I totally stole that white boy summer joke from Sean. I'm very sorry. Also, <laughs> speaking of China, I'm very glad what happened to a certain someone recently as a pro wrestling fan myself. Oh. Because oh, John God. Cena You can say dest- him. I don't think they care. Yeah, they don't care. Um, John Cena basically destroyed the last remnants of the attitude and ruthless aggression era. <laughs> John Cena ruined everything. Fuck you, John <laughs> Cena. Even Roman Reigns is better by- than you by comparison. Uh, I'm so glad that he was made to cuck out to the uh, mm. the Chai Coms. So oh, by the way, you don't, speaking of you don't love, 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 love John Cena. I, I wish I knew the Mandarin. For more like uh, more like John, more like John China. But uh, by the way, speaking <laughs> listen, speaking five of... <laughs> moves including five moves including doing this. That's all John Cena is. Yeah. Five moves including the. Well, well, he, here's where I, here's where I want to get to in this conversation. <laughs> you so... can't you can't CCP me. <laughs> so okay so the that was a okay. reference to kevin nash where they're like he has five moves including the hair flip so that's oh man 
Yeah, All right, so see. okay, so here's where I want to get to, fellas. So the United States uh, is getting cucked by China. Oh wait, we didn't ask also... Jake if he believes in. Oh, oh yeah, Jake. Yes, go you for it. You believe in? Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you I, think? I think I'm probably kind of along the lines of Brian. Is it, it's probably more of like a follow the money kind of thing. Is um, there's going there's going to be at, like at this point. I mean, and probably. So as everybody knows, I run a libertarian event. I'm I'm pretty hardcore anarchist libertarian. Um, the I, I'm kind of of the opinion that there was a corporate takeover of the United States government back when the Constitution was written. So it's just kind of like that's the world that we live in is that it's just a basically corporate corporate move. And if you follow the money, you see this kind of going on and you see this, you know, you brought up John Cena, but we can also see this with the NBA and uh, and what's the one Disney NBA star and, that really is yeah. big into that? Um, uh, um, what's his I name? don't know. The, uh, I know who, uh, LeBron Kobe James. Bryant? LeBron James. Know, well, LeBron no, James. Kobe Bryant died, but <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah LeBron yeah. James, yeah, LeBron James, yeah. So Kobe yeah, Bryant I mean, was going to expose the Chinese origins of the coronavirus. <laughs> so you're get rid before of he had an unfortunate yeah, accident. But but I mean, I, I would even say that the the Chinese Communist Party, though, at this point, is although I I, I do think they're authoritarian fascists, um, you know, which sounds kind of counterintuitive intuitive to uh, communism, but at this well, point, well, it is, it is just a corporate takeover. Pragmatic. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's it's just it's a and, and and I think Brian is correct. Just follow the money. You follow the money, you find mm -hmm. what's going on. Q is interesting, and I really actually, I I love conspiracy theory stuff. It's very entertaining and all that sort of stuff. But I do think it's kind of a distraction. If if you look like where weapon sales are going, where resource sales are going, that sort of stuff is any time there's any sort of semblance of peace starting to kind of crop up something new is invented and that's going to funnel more money into the military industrial complex. Uh, mm -hmm. Like Sean was talking about it, it, it. I mean, you just can see it historically like over and over and over again. Uh, and that's kind of what I think like Q, I think there's, it is a mix. It's sort of some people actually do have good, interesting points on that. Whoever Q is, I don't know. And I don't, I frankly don't care that much, but, um, but I think it's just sort of a mix of like opinions. It's too ambiguous to really say one way or the other, but you can look and see where money is flowing and where money is flowing is the military industrial complex. And I think that's kind of what's going on. It's not, a, I, I wouldn't even say it's a conspiracy. It's just the natural flow of authoritarian power, which from my opinion is government in general is just, it always will go toward authoritarianism. That's why I think- mm -hmm. Anarchy well, this kind of uh, this kind of leads me to uh, the question that I wanted to ask originally, which is if right now the United States is getting cucked by China, the United States was getting cucked by uh, the USSR beforehand. If we're talking about, let's say, the people who were entrenched within the government, the various uh, people within academia during the uh, 50s, 60s and so on and so forth. And Actually, then what and well, then I, I what, think uh, it's, it's a corporate cucking and, and who, whoever the cuck the cuck object is or whatever is just changed it doesn't it's sure yeah no no but, but here here's the point that i want to get to though when it comes to there being a certain mentality of the grass is green around the other side what i want to try to figure out here if possible is we have certain conflicts that we get into where let's say like the korean war for instance where did so certain businesses profit from it absolutely Businesses profited from there. They profited from World War II as well. All kinds of business profit from war. What I get to here, though, is that when it comes to, let's say, a more of a moral question of what is required or was required at the time to defend places that did not want to be under communist rule, then I'm not saying that it's an easy decision to make, but at least for me, it is in the realm of like thing like, how much should the United States or other countries put into fighting something that back at that time, you know, people were pretty confident that this thing could engulf the entire world. And as somebody who came from the USSR and whose families had a lot of, uh, you know, pretty bad experiences, to put it uh, mm. the least, uh, in there, this is not a place that I want to see uh, gobbling up the world, nor sure. is it a place that I'm sure the South Koreans, as they later on became, you know, they were just Koreans back then, uh, wanted uh, to engulf the world. Yet you still have, let's say, whether it's Korea, whether it's Vietnam, for all the horrible things with, you know, McNamara and his statistics and uh, having all these young men go in there and not know what the fuck they were doing. For all of that negative uh, aspects, uh, for all of those negative aspects, my big problem is when you have certain celebrities 
that get paid by and propped up by the USSR who go on and talk about, you know, how evil American supremacy is and the Pentagon and all that. What, at the end of the day, is the end result that people are aiming for when it comes to all these various conflicts? And I think part of it is also like the Thomas Sowell quote of uh, what are the unintended consequences? What are the unintended consequences of, let's say, if we said, you know what, fuck you, Korea, like, uh, we don't care what happens to you. The USSR could go in there for all we care. We're just going to worry about us. We're looking out for number one. So mm -hmm. what would the unintended consequences of that be? And the reason why I'm mentioning this is in a way to play devil's advocate for certain things that have transpired when it comes to things that, Sean, you really uh, enjoy digging into and seeing how exactly all these things came about. Can we, this is, this is my question, can we separate things that, let's say, if we all got into a room together and I locked the key, which I always love saying, and just got you in a room with, I don't know, whether it's Bill Crystal or uh, whoever. people or the Doles who would... Brothers. Sure, and you sure. And revolver I'm a with one bullet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> who would... <laughs> but, yeah, but my, but my point here is that if there was this conversation where maybe they would be able to convince you that, look, this is such a shitty choice. And yes, people are going to profit from this. I say, oh my God, that's pretty terrible. But at the end of the day, this shitty choice is the best choice that could possibly be made in this, uh, in this environment versus things that are absolutely blatantly 100% wealth extraction bullshit that we don't have to have. That mm. we could still like make sure that, let's say, places that want to preserve a certain amount of... Uh, freedom and not become part of a totalitarian dictatorship that they still have something that they can reach out to with all the corruption and with all the money making that will go on in the process as well well just before we get into that like to set the stage a little bit is you know once when the communist revolution happened a lot of americans went over there and they looked at the industrial equipment that the that the communist russians had and stuff like that and they went oh my gosh this is amazing we don't have anything like this but then if they looked a little bit deeper everything said made in detroit so yes, the, yes, the issue exactly. the, the issue is that the communists wouldn't have existed had the corporate interests of the United States not been funding all of these different things. And and that's I, I would say maybe that's the extent of my like conspiracy mindedness or whatever, is that if you start looking at where things come from, you start seeing it trace back to these sort of oligarchs in, in that are you know, I'm I'm anti-government in general, but it's it's the sort of regulatory capture where they basically capture this and then they end up funding this to people that that we would say from our point of view are authoritarians, which I agree. Like the, the Soviet Union, you know, I'm married to a a former uh, Soviet Union woman. Um, well, actually, I guess the Soviet Union collapsed. Well, you, you Ukrainians born. a little bit different. They never got enslaved by the Mongols, so they're uh, they yeah. don't have as much, <laughs> as much psychological Nobody damage. Right? Yeah. yeah. But the, but the issue is that like a lot of that stuff that was going on. I mean, like for example, the, the Holodomor. That is a that is directly because of the United States' action in the Depression. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. I heard a guy on Twitter who had five different flags in his display name, and he said the Hall of Demore is fake and actually it's a Nazi patterns. lie. It is not fake. Patterns, bro. <laughs> yeah, Stalin uh, controlled the clouds. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> told yeah, it not machines. to rain on those Ukrainians. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's the, that's the thing is that like the Hall of Demore. I mean, we. I mean, again, my family was not there, but I am married to somebody whose family was there, and the the Hall of Demore happened, and it was you know, between four and 10 million people starved to death as a result of the United States burning wheat and not selling it mm. it caused wheat prices to inflate. So then Stalin goes, oh, like I've got this failing economic system. I can sell wheat on the international market by starving these people in Ukraine mm. to basically fund this terrible economic system that is insolvent, does not work. But because FDR is back in the United States burning all of it, paying people not to grow food and just basically causing international market havoc. I can sell this internationally at the expense of starving, you know, between four and 10 million people, which is not a big deal to a dictator. Like they don't care. It's numbers to them. That's, and, why, and once... that's why Ukrainian women are so thin and beautiful now. Cause the ones that survived. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think so. My, my wife is quite beautiful. So, <laughs> and very thin. So yeah. You can you can save money if you date a Ukrainian woman because they'll just order the appetizers. 
<laughs> you know, I, I wanted to uh, jump in here and I'm not going to comment on anyone except for my beautiful wife. But um, by I the way, would, your uh, wife is very beautiful and lovely. She is a silver fox. Um, and please let her come on BTR to debate me about the beauty myth. Do you just, I just Lev, reach yeah. out anytime. I'm sure she'd love to Excellent. hop into a discussion. Right. That would be great. Um, but I, I wanted to, you know, I, and I, I, I actually agree with almost everything everyone is saying. So I, I but I, I do want to just get this in there so I don't lose this. I apologize. But when people talk about communism taking over and the communists are taking over and, and we're there again, I don't see China as, as a truly communist country. I mean, it, on the surface it is, but mm. really Xi Jinping's form of communism is a lie. This is a way to get people to basically move forward and not question, which feeds the profit margins. Because, you know, if you look at, and it, you ask Lev where it's going, well, the beauty of it is that they've, the Chinese uh, government has told us, if you look at Made in China 2025, and then you look at the Chinese dream of 2049, which is also the 100-year anniversary of the revolution. That's exactly where they want it to go. And you can see a lot of what's playing out in our own country very much mirrors 1967 cultural revolution. You can see what's happening in our country very much mirrors what happens with a lot of countries that were early uh, signers onto the Belt and Road Initiative where there's a division, there's a, there's a, a domestic threat, okay? And then all of a sudden there's a devaluing of currency. Well, now they're ripe to have these economies sign on with the Belt and Road. And the, the timing of it, if you look at 2025 plan, the timing of it is made in China. They wanna be the supply chain for the world. So when I look at this, you know, and it's a question I always ask people, like, well, why, why, why do people want to control everyone? Because no one ever seems to be able to answer that question. Like people say they want to control us and big government wants to control. Well, why? And on my, you know, I've always acted, especially doing you know, everything from government intelligence to private competitive intelligence for healthcare, where I was out there finding out what the competitors were doing. It's always about money. And now there's people along the way who usually middle management, that they're really idealistic. My middle management, I mean, it could be a, you know, an NGO leader who's really out there speaking with the megaphone. They really believe it. And, and a lot of the causes they believe in are, are good causes. But at the top of most of these things, and you had mentioned, I can never pronounce his name, but the Russian propagandist who defected. Yuri, Yuri Bezmanov. Bezmanov. Yeah. And I've watched, I've watched that 1984 which is an, an apt year, um, so many times, and it makes sense. And I, I don't want to go too far into what I used to do, Geo, um, but the, you know, what I see there makes a lot of sense. You, you break out real, but not that divisive topics. You dust them off, you fire them up, and you create chaos. And then through that chaos, you can get the contracts you want. It, look, every time there is a, like the first thing I did when the election happened uh, and, and there was a big upset, uh, yeah, I went to every CN site I could get onto, every Chinese site. And the first thing I found was a speech from Xi Jinping the day before where he was talking about, we can expect to get $1.9 trillion in the next three years. Things are looking good. And they call them in dollar imports. Dollar imports hmm. means U.S. dollars coming in. Now, that number might sound a little familiar to you, and I, I'm, I've put it on Twitter, but I'll provide the link to that speech. You know, there's, there's a, there is a big, I think what we're seeing here is we are seeing a big first-year MBA business plan on a global level, and it kind of acts like a casino where you – you're working, you get so much money, but then you're buying stuff that goes to the very people you're working for. And if you look at the companies that have profited from this lockdown, um, they are those companies that are online retailers. They are those Amazon companies. Amazon in particular. We're on one right now. And hmm. if you... Oh. Brian? Oh no, they got him. They oh, got no. him, Sean. Oh. Sean, you're next. Uh, yeah. uh, Got to close uh, the windows. Hopefully Brian comes back, but uh, maybe comment upon that. And wait, I guess, wait, I'm going to join him. Stuff. 
Oh, oh there, there we go. go. Brian, Brian back. is back. And I also oh, want to make gone? sure that you... Yes, you were gone. Uh, like they they got to you, but, you, but you're back. On. <laughs> okay. And I also want to make sure that Sean also uh, gets to uh, answer uh, the thing that I was uh, talking about earlier. Sure, I'll make it. I'll, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll uh, finish up. What I was saying was, what was the last thing you guys heard? Oh, about the contract. Uh, the money. The money. Can, can you narrow the, that down? The, the, <laughs> the, the plan, the... Yeah. yeah. So it's, you know, to me, it looks like when, I, you know, knowing China 2025 and China 2049, <laughs> so these plans, this looks to me when I look at it like one big business plan um, where the companies that profited, for instance, from the lockdowns, you know, these are all online companies, you know, look at Home Depot and then look at their stockholders, look at Walmart, then look at their stockholders. Um, and the numbers for COVID, the COVID tracking project numbers all um, and then even a lot of the numbers the New York Times are citing, uh, and I'll pull this up and share it, you can see that that was run by an NGO, um, and that NGO is comprised of Zoom and, um, you know, Walmart we're, we're and right Amazon, now, yeah. and, and I'm like, well, that, you know, I, I don't want to steal this, my, my wife made a good point, and, and she, she didn't say it as a fact, as she said, you know, wouldn't that give someone really good control over the stock market if they knew what the numbers for COVID were before the market opened? Now, did she say that was happening? No, of course not. Um, but if you really think about it, yeah. And I think a big problem a lot of people have accepting is, and I, you hear this all the time. Yeah, but they wouldn't do that. Yeah, but they wouldn't do. Well, why not? I mean, why not? When people say about, for instance, the CCP, well, they wouldn't do that. Really? Because they were only letting people have one child up until a few years ago, and they just extended that to three children just last week. Why wouldn't they do that? Um, and so, of course, they'll do that. Humans will do anything. And, and in my work, especially when I was in the military, I've seen the horrible things humans will do to each other. And so I have no trouble believing what people will do for profit, especially at the levels we're talking. I mean, this is beyond FU money. I mean, this is like split the earth in two beginning of the latest Superman movie type money. So, I mean, I always tell people like, just because someone calls something a conspiracy theory, do not dismiss it, look into it yourself and maybe not announce that you believe this now, but you know, when people are telling you not to believe something but they haven't really given you a link or shown you what it is you shouldn't believe, you should probably look into that, especially if it affects your life. That's, that's, that's I've said my piece. <laughs> <laughs> so Sean, what do you think of that? And also, I don't know if you follow to, to go to Lev's question. I don't know if you followed the trajectory of uh, if you've been reading the recent mold bug writings on his gray mirror, how he talks about the brown scare. But this is an older idea coming from people like Cleon Skousen, the naked communist. Um, what is your reading of history, but also what Brian said about just in general, how the sort of Brian and Jake, like the corporate takeover of America? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the way I've conceptualized this is, again, when I talk about the neoliberal turn is uh, people say this term can't really be defined. Well, how I define neoliberalism is the capture of the nation state by the multinational corporation. So you do have these U.S. multinationals like Amazon or Walmart. They're ostensibly headquarters in the United States, but they don't have any loyalty or interest in the American government. They certainly don't give a shit about American workers. They're just trying to make a profit anywhere on the globe. So, you know, Nike, another example. So essentially like what you have is the United States as a nation state has become a rest stop for these multinational corporations. The, the leadership, the government leadership in the United States, they have absolutely no long-term plan. They're just stripping the copper wire out of this thing and selling it for <laughs> scrap. Yeah. And they're doing it because they are part, uh, like you can say accurately that they are controlled by the multinational corporations, but you shouldn't even think of them as a separate entity. They go from the government to the multinational corporate board, back to the government, you know, Goldman Sachs, back and forth from the treasury. It's all just one thing. And so in terms of like what my politics are, in terms of a solution to that, it's, it's really a reassertion of the nation state. And, and so like, I, I want to be careful about how I deal with China, because I do think it is accurate to say that, as I said earlier, 
China being allowed to enter the WTO, permanent normalized trade relations with China um, under Bill Clinton, I think absolutely destroyed this country. Um, so, but I don't blame China for that. I blame the leadership and the government of the United States for that. Yep. So my goal is for the government, the nation state of the United States to reassert itself. And that's not, you know, with a giant military naval buildup against China in the Pacific. I don't give a shit. I don't want a new Cold War with China. I just want a government that is going to, you know, have an industrial plan and provide jobs here and look out for American workers and, and these sorts of things. So, so that's kind of how I... Um, conceptualize that and then i could go on a longer tangent about but isolationism a, if you'd like well yeah but oh, that's more ahead, of the Bill. reason that's more of the reason why i want to play devil's advocate here and say like sean if we were to isolate ourselves looking bad at the korean war or any of these other conflicts if we're talking about china as maybe not just being the supermarket of the world like uh, brian was saying but also another thing that brian was pointing out how their ideology you could say the uh, techno feudalism as somebody in the chat refer to it as if mm. this shit starts spreading into other places in the world now you could say oh well the people who are the elites in, New in uh, the united states they don't give a shit sure fine but that's not my point my point specifically is i am not sure if the approach of completely isolating ourselves and saying you know you do you to all the other nations in the world regarding actors that are actually hostile if that's the right solution here as well because sometimes you, like I said before, sometimes people make money from conflicts and never let a good tragedy go to waste. But at the same time, if there are certain points in history where it does require having a base or two in a particular location so that certain other countries, as long as they still exist on this planet, you know, don't uh, get, uh, you know, to, to, to the level that people who share in our uh, similar ways of life, because again, there's all kinds of hellish worlds on the earth. Like uh, Brian, you've been uh, all over. I'm sure you know how much uh, in different places in the world. I know this was something we were talking uh, before with uh, Tom Sauer, how he was talking about just seeing like dismembered uh, limbs and uh, all kinds of horrible stuff in all of these third world places. Yes, life is hell for a lot of people in the world yet we still manage to get people to a certain extent of uh, understanding the value of having a certain degree of, auto of autonomy, a certain degree of liberty. And now that the people have that, to have that taken away and to have this uh, uh, state that was referred to again as this uh, technocratic dystopia becoming the norm for a lot of people while America is going to sit back and do nothing, I don't think that's the right way either. So I'm trying to see, like, how do we balance out America taking care of America's needs while still not turning its back on, you know, situations of that sort, even if there may be some corruption or not, you know, even if there may be people, companies that are going to make money from that, you know, just because I don't mm. think you got like a perfect thing. But that's kind of like I, what I'm trying to see. Yes. Can I give can I give you a quick a quick, I guess, not really a counterpoint, but just a, a different thing is sure. the United States has been occupying Afghanistan for 20 years. It's still a hellhole. The United States has been occupying Afghanistan for 18 years or uh, Iraq for 18 years. It's still a hellhole. Uh, and actually, it's a worse hellhole than when Saddam was in charge of it. Like, I, I actually know people who immigrated yeah. to the United States. Uh, so the thing is, is I think that a lot of this stuff is we perceive this because I think this is the the narrative. And I hate to keep going back to this, but this is sort of the corporate news narrative, the sort of thing that is is occupying our mind or whatever is that the united states is good and the united states will bring this to other people this is a shining hill on the thing. rock yeah it, it's a cultural thing it takes a lot of effort and we i i even get this with my wife who i love dearly or whatever but she, you know we we have stuff that happens here in the united states like for example uh i, I don't have a specific example of this because it ha this type of thing happens once in a while and i hope she's probably listening so i hope that she doesn't get mad at me for saying this but uh, there'll be once in a while, there'll be like a thing where I'm dealing with my neighbor, for example, and she'll be like, well, fuck them. Like, who cares? And I'm like, that is a very like un-American. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It, it's sort of like, a, like, that's their problem. That's not our problem. And I'm like, no, like we do need to, we do need to figure out a way to like make this work out. And, and, and I understand her point of view too on it because it's like, so right now we're dealing with this issue where I think my pool 
is like saturating the groundwater and leaking into my neighbor's garage. I think, I don't know for sure, <laughs> but- Well, as so, an anarcho-capitalist, how do you deal with that one? <laughs> exactly, it, it, well, it, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird situation, but as an anarcho-capitalist, you know, our solution to everything is insurance, right? So, uh, <laughs> so I, I, I don't know what to do about it. I've never had a pool before, and but I freaking love having It's amazing a pool. how you have the tragedy of the commons problem right in your backyard. Yeah. I find yeah. that hilarious. Oh, it, it, it's, it's, bizar it's bizarre <laughs> because it's like, I'm, I'm struggling with this because I just got back from Childeberg, which is the biggest anarchist thing that I go to because I run it, but like, and then I get back and this dude's like, hey, you're- You pool can't party. run an anarchist festival. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> it runs itself. I, I, I start the it balls- It runs itself. <laughs> I, start, I start the balls rolling. Story, I start dude. the balls, balls rolling. So, but oh. like, so I come back and this guy's like, hey, you know, your pool is flooding my garage. And I'm like, well, I don't know if that's true because we've also <laughs> here, here, here in Texas- <laughs> Here in Texas, we've had we've oh had like deluge God. rain for like last three weeks. So I don't know that it's my pool that's flooding his garage. It could just be the rain. But I I also want a good relationship with my neighbor. So we have to sort of like oh my God. You know, Yeah, we have to have like we have to and he's a cool dude. He's a really nice guy. But so but I don't know what to do about it. I've never had a pool before. I don't know how this works. So what what's the solution? It almost <laughs> think you need like a, a certain body above both of you to and we sort have of one. impartially mediate. We have one and it and it, we have one and it's private. It's called my homeowner's insurance and his homeowner's insurance. There we go. You're I'd rather, right. I'd insurance. rather live in communist a communist dictatorship than be run by a homeowner's association my whole life. No, no, no. We have no homeowners no homeowners association in our neighborhood. We oh, each have homeowner good. we have each have insurance. Mm. So like I have I have property owner's insurance, he has property owner's insurance. And the property owner insurance, I don't know about him, but the property owner insurance I have is not mandated by the states. I bought it because I was like, well, if a tree like falls on somebody or whatever, I don't want liability issues. So like I bought it and it's, it's not expensive, but it's like, it's also not super cheap either. So anyways, all that aside, I don't remember my point exactly because <laughs> well, we were talking about having countries in in a conflict and what the position of the U.S. should be yeah. regarding them. You were talking about Afghanistan, right? What I want to stress though is South Korea. Is South Korea shithole? And well, South Korea is better off. But what about Vietnam, where we spent well, years and years and years in Vietnam, and thousands of American lives, and it's not better. I agree. Or, we did we did it in a really shitty way. We shouldn't have yep. done that way. But what about my, my proposition what about the, here? What about the uh, what are they called? The Houthi and the Tutus. What about them? No, that was terrible. Yeah. Yeah. What about what about Yemen? Mm. What about I can mm. give you I can just name off thousands of cases that the United States has semi been involved in, where the result of the American government being involved resulted in terrible consequences. Well, Yemen, look at the Balkans, Yemen, even in your neck of the woods. I mean, yeah, but, but, I then, say, but then I mean, even here, there's, say, there's some... Yes, go on. I would say in, in all of these cases, I mean, it's never... And this is not to, you know, just blindly defend the U.S., but like you talk about Yemen or the Hutus and the Tutsis, um, or even, even South Korea, um, which I, I, I love South Korea. But um, the thing is, like, there's other countries involved. I mean, Yemen's a great example. Yeah, yeah, Saudi Arabia, they hold sway over that oh, entire sure. area. Sure, and, and the United States backs Saudi Arabia up. Well, there is that but one country in the Middle East that they do, the but, things. you know, but, um, Saudi Arabia backs yeah. the United States up too. And they right Saudi left? Arabia backs everyone yes. up, whatever meets their needs. So but, I, well, I so, think, yeah, I mean, my, I, I, as a libertarian, point, my thing is yeah. everyone leave each other alone. <laughs> you know, like well, just, and that, that would be thing. my, that would be my greater yeah. point. My, my point as an anarchist libertarian would be, we can form markets around how this stuff is going to work out, but how do you choose which you can't, you can't defend everybody. There's, there's right. way too many conflicts going on where you can defend Believe it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Allow markets to develop for people. There's certain, there's certain countries where that I care about and there's certain countries that other people care about, but the United States government is sort of a, you know, panacea of supposedly what everybody thinks there's 350 million people here. Mm -hmm. It does not work to have the United States government decide what's going to happen everywhere. One of the reasons that, that Israel like functions as a independent state is because the United States government backs them, but it's not the yeah. only reason. The other reason is because American evangelicals back them yeah. to the tune of billions of dollars a year, absent of the government. 
there, there is, there is a, there's several instances where the United States as a government can be involved and it's going to generate bad consequences. There's several instances where Americans as individuals can be involved and it can generate bad consequences and the opposite. But why would you, it, it, like Israel is a really great example of this. Why would you involve all Americans to prop up Israel when 40%, maybe more of Americans support Palestine? So well, they need mm, money for the missiles. I mean, they're really. I, mean, I don't. I don't. I don't know if it's forty percent. I, I don't know I, what the percentage is. And what I what you I, know, I mean, you're like, talking about Hamas, not yeah. Palestine. Well, you know, you, you, yeah, you are. But you're you're not Hamas talking about. You're not talking about a even the Palestinian people don't want. You know, so that I, I don't think. I mean, I hear you, but uh, you know, I and I, I always kind of stay away from this. This I, I understand the his, history of this argument very deeply. Not but, not me and Geo. We don't stay away from it, do we? I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, my thing is, I, I don't think you can, uh, you know, bring in a comparison of, of you know modern Palestine and Israel next to each other as a equal comparison in making no, an opinion. I, think, I, I don't I think, think that really works. No, and I, I see what you're saying, but I what I would I would say is that at a certain point you have to stop tangling the twine. And Israel is a good example of something that is so tangled up by Britain, then the United States, uh, Germany moving Israelis or moving Jews into Israel, which are they were European. Like there's a lot of complexity there that at some point, and this was kind of Ron Paul's perspective when he talked about this in the 2008 and 2012 campaign is we marched right in, we can march right out. It is complicated. I get it. But at a certain point, you have to leave and, and you have to stop. You have to stop muddying the waters and allow it well, to work out. It's right. Own. But I'd also say, too, and I'm, I'm sorry, I just got to address this. You know, all of those Palestinian refugees from 1948 and on, how many of the Arab countries have taken them in? None. No. But, but, None because but, that see, that, 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 that's a whole other thing is that they're not other, Arab. Hmm. That's, that's something well. that that's, that's how we perceive it. I like I've, I've well worked. no no this is this is actually very important oh, wait, I to get, quotion here hold hold on Gio I really got to say this Sean this, who's this is balancing out yes yes I know we got a communist Mark I know we yeah. need to, yes look Sean <laughs> let me give you an example there was this lady who I know this Russian lady who uh, had uh, she had cancer and oh. uh, the um, doctors in uh, the um, the Russian Federation they were no good uh, so what she decided to do was that she decided to uh, go to Israel. Now, she was not Jewish herself. She was a native Russian. So she decided to, let's say, um, went to a rabbi. Oh. She did a certain, uh, she, yeah, she did a certain performance, you could say, like read the Torah a little bit here and there, got in the ritual bath because she had to be converted to Orthodox uh, Jewish. So then when she actually went to Israel, she took off, her, uh, you know, took off whatever, like, uh, clothing she was supposed to wear as an Orthodox Jew, put on jeans, put on, like, a uh, loose uh, shirt with uh, a lot of uh, revealing uh, areas, and just went to the beach and uh, hung out there, and nobody gave a shit. The reason hmm. why I'm saying this is... I think that there are some people out there, and I may include you in there. I don't know if you are a fan of uh, Rousseau. Do you like Rousseau? Oh, I think he's fine. I... <laughs> Yeah, well, I like Rousseau, his early Rousseau, stuff. Rousseau, uh, I think he kind of went too mainstream later on. But yeah. <laughs> okay, well, Rousseau has this idea of uh, you know the way that he looks at humankind, the way that he looks at people, where I think it's a similar reason why we have somebody like Jane Fonda, for instance, who ended up going to uh, the communists in Vietnam, regardless of all the things that they were doing and mm. uh, supporting them. That there is this tendency of looking at somebody who may not be as technologically advanced as being the underdog. And I think a lot of people on the left tend to view things from uh, that perspective you mean like the general one... like third worldism in other words yeah yeah exactly mm -hmm. so but the only thing that i would add there is that when it comes to and this was a point that uh we were uh, bringing up before when we had tom sower on who was a former uh, navy bomb squad when we were talking about you remember this geo when we were talking about the roof knocking a technique that the israeli army uses to intentionally warn palestinians that a certain building is going to be targeted so that the innocent have a chance to escape from there and i always want to say let's flip it up imagine the palestinians 
doing that. And imagine the Palestinians allowing a woman who, let's say, have cancer, go in there and then take off whatever rep repressive religious clothing she uh, has no need to wear and just go about her life. There are certain standards, like how I can, let's well, say, have a certain hier hierarchy. No, 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 I don't, I don't think it is. I think that there are certain standards that you were born with, that I was born with, that I'm sure all the people in this uh, panel were born with, that we hold as being something that is morally upright. And we see that being expressed in not, let's say, certain instances that, let's say, a media that uh, they don't really have a lot of the choice in the matter. I sent this article to Geo before as well. When it comes to if you are a media entity that is working within Palestine, you have to go with the narrative of Hamas. You don't have any choice. That's the only way that you can be there. So mm -hmm. when you have a combination of it's that true. and a combination of how people are treated in general in Israel, even the people who would, uh, you know, not be Jewish, if we're talking about not just the Arabians, or if we're talking about the Druze, if we're talking about Arabians, both Muslim and non-Muslim, the point here that I'm getting to is that there is still a difference of how a person approaches life and how a person approaches what is fair and what is just, where you can pick various examples of bad actors doing bad things but as far as public policy as far as policy that is being followed as much as the government of israel can it's not a hard choice for me personally at least in terms of what i am currently siding with and i'm trying to do research please send me as much as you can well, sean let me i want the you question. To, i, I want you to send me the worst the worst that you can i'd rather we move on from this topic but sean what do you think of the whole Oh God! Why are we even talking about this? I I, I I wrecked it. I shouldn't have brought up Israel. Go, yeah. go ahead, Sean. It, it's please. way, oh it's way too controversial. I wanted to talk about how the co the communists now, just as a uh, play devil's advocate, some people say Yuri Bezmenov was a kind of like a con artist or whatever. But Sean, you go ahead, my friend. What do you think? All right. Of the whole... <laughs> All right. So fifteen yeah. seconds. Israel Palestine. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, God. Do we have a cartoon uh, to go with this? Like on yeah. YouTube. <laughs> The way we draw on the board, yeah. <laughs> no, they're, you've seen them, right? <laughs> Go ahead. No, I mean, sorry, I, I think. Oh no, no worries. I I think I can tie this into some some wider points we're making here. I mean, like uh, my personal actual opinion on Israel is I don't. I believe it's in violation of international law regarding the settlements, and I think the United States should not be paying them any foreign aid. I I, I don't care if they do that on their own time. What, I just don't. What like... about the unintended consequences? Don't of interrupt him. Don't interrupt there. him. Don't interrupt him. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, I just don't like, you know, paying for that as a U.S. taxpayer. But the the second point, and this goes back into like what are derisively called the isolationists and all that, which used to be a major tendency in the Republican Party. And it's I totally disagree with Ron Paul on economic issues, but I think his foreign policy is perfectly sensible. And I think something he said that I think is very wise and that gets ignored by the left is that. You know, regardless of whether or not you think they were morally justified, Ron Paul is correct, in my opinion, that every single war in the United States since the Second World War has been unconstitutional. I don't care if the Congress thinks they can, like, pass the war powers to the executive. They can't. It's spelled out in the Constitution. The Congress has to declare war against a nation state. And that's actually a very smart thing that the founders of this country did, because one person should not be deciding to go to war. If you can't get a majority of the senators and the Congress people to say, we have to be at war with this nation, you should not be at war with this nation. And I think non-interference in the internal affairs of other nation states is a good policy for the United States. Uh, and, you know, there's so many, you could spend all day listing the examples of blowback when we fucked this up, but, you know, Iran, Mossadegh, we overthrew an elected government and we, they still hate us today because of it. Guatemala, why is everybody from Guatemala come to the United States? Because we overthrew an elected government and set off a fucking genocide, you know, from the 50s to the 80s. We made that place hell on earth because we had to, because we were so worried that these, you know, we thought they were socialists in the 50s. You know, the Dulles brothers thought Mossadegh, because he nationalized British oil, was, was going to align with the communists. They thought our Benz in Guatemala was some sort of communist just because he wanted to, uh, you know, nationalize Would he have some allied stuff. with the communists, though? I'm curious. Like, how do we know that he wouldn't? Well, Doesn't it's, matter. and I'm not saying that they were right. I'm no, just yeah, saying, yeah. like, is, how, how do we. Issue. Go like, if this. you, if you are, if you're economically sound as far as I'm concerned, 
it should not matter what economic policy other countries have, because if you are not a capitalist, your country will fail at some point. You can, you can, you can try to extract as much wealth as you want from your country, but at some point, the capitalist countries will overtake you because they are, they are producing wealth. And at a certain point, the Soviet Union cannot produce wealth anymore or mm -mm. some sort of socialist country in some other. Well, in know. the modern context, though, with China, for example, if I China know, or, I mean, or Russia were to start overtaking different countries, would the same thing you, be applied? If you, cu if you cut up, if you cut off the consumption market of the United States from China, they will fail. He is absolutely correct. And that is. That has been recommended. Sorry, to, I'm going to give you back the mic no, in two seconds. It. I'm raising you up because that is the best way to deal with China. Back to that original question is, first of all, make them on equal footing with every other WTO country. Do you know China is still a developing nation, according to the WTO, which gives them all sorts of perks. Um, and then also... You could look at the Paris Accords. They don't have to start reducing emissions to like, I think, 2030. Well, by then, every other competitor in fuels of any kind, man, they're almost bankrupt because they have to meet all these emission standards. Really, how can you enforce that by 2030? And so I, I think to your point, you're absolutely correct. Um, you know, capitalist countries will win. The minute we start, um, you know, kowtowing to non-capitalist countries, we're going to lose. And then they're going to lose, then the world loses, except for a few people at the top. And then we're all basically enslaved and working crappy jobs like in 1984, yeah. you know? And so- But then, but already, then what's the game plan? The problem, though, we're already working crappy jobs. I mean, uh, me. I think the problem is just the job definition rocks. of capitalism uh, itself. I, I mean, well, but, the thing is though, crappy jobs, compared to what so i, I think well i mean like for instance things. like working to live so kind of like that black mirror episode where like well yeah 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 well i well, mean we i am agreeing with you that, but i would say to push back geo to begin with, it, it, it i mean the thing is is like there, this is something that people talk about a lot is like the soulless soulless progression to you know some sort of dystopian future or whatever but like just look a hundred years ago how awful it was to just be a like well from our perspective how awful it was to just be around like mm, it, it, sure. you know there was you worked for 16 hours a day in a factory and you you know even though you didn't have any taxes you you know or very low taxes you know you were doing all of these things that were really terrible I think life was very difficult uh you're you know i i live in like a 300 or 3000 square foot house or whatever and uh but like if you were wealthy, you lived in like a thousand square foot house a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. And so like our, our material prosperity has increased a great deal in the last hundred years. And we do kind of, we conceptualize this like future where things are awful and stuff like that. But like, it's also, and, and Tom Woods brings this up a lot. And I think this is a really great point is people bring up a lot of stuff and they, <laughs> and it's always compared to what. So if you say, Oh, like we're going to, we're going to be going into this future that like is really awful or whatever, awful compared to what? So awful compared to like 1850, where the majority of people were barely subsisting or compared to 1950, where people were being elevated out of poverty very, very quickly. So it, it, there's, there's a lot of perspective that I think modern people do not have. And it's because capitalism has brought so much wealth to the world that we can have these conversations where we're like, oh, well, you know, like Bernie Sanders brings this up all the time where he's like, oh, you know, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, all these places are socialist countries. They have a lot of government programs, but over the last 10 years, they've had to start getting away from those programs because they don't have any money left. Mm -hmm. But at the same time to push back, I mean, we are seeing a massive stagnation in wealth, the massive sort of Brasilification of the social strata being the very rich and the very poor. And at the same sure. time, that's just, again, to Sean's point, that's just the development of material conditions itself. And whether or not you can say that the very predatory form of modern capital that we have now is akin to some romantic ideal that a lot of libertarians unfortunately have. I mean, I, I don't know. Sean, please help me out here. Please save me. <laughs> Wait, actually, oh, Gio, I, Gio, I just want to answer to that really quickly. Oh, go. I think the biggest attack on wealth and the the chance to have a choice and and grow a small business is happening since january i mean literally like 
if you're a small business owner, which is the spirit of entrepreneurship in this country, it all starts small. Shit, Bill Gates started small. Uh, the point is right now, that's almost impossible to do. I am a small business owner. And I remember even under Obama, they started going after 1099 abuse mm -hmm. and trying to say that your long-term contractor, for instance, oh, that's an employee, you gotta pay all this back employer tax. And back employer tax in America will break your business. Oh, yeah. um, so no, that's I, true. I mean, coming my father coming from a small business background. Well, it, it's, not, it's, it is, it's, the, yeah. the government does punish you, especially here in Canada. I mean, so what, what I see right now is the biggest attack on the ability to have wealth and grow wealth. Because, you know, right now, when you dump money into the system, you're devaluing the dollar. It makes it harder to afford people to even hire. Um, I remember when Obamacare came in. I, you know, I switched everything to a project-based type thing because I, as a small business, cannot afford to provide everyone health care. And, but, you know, who can afford it are the big established businesses. And, 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 so, and sort of on that point, so I, I do financial software development. That's my profession. And one of the biggest windfalls that I've had in my career as a software developer was when Obamacare came in and people had to track the number of hours their employees or semi-employees had because that was the other thing is it was unclear what an employee was at that point because it had mm -hmm. to do with the number of hours they were working for you and you had to record that mm -hmm. whether or not they were actually your employee or not from your perspective it was it was a government perspective on that and it it crushed businesses because i did i did software development for uh, a small payroll company so we did it was mm -hmm. it the number of businesses that went out like went out or changed their whole model was astronomical. The amount of people who lost jobs because of Obamacare was crazy. It was, it costs uh, like 40 bucks per paycheck per employee just to record whether or not they qualify for health insurance or not. And then you have to pay another two fifty, uh, $2 and 50 cents per employee to report that to the government at the end of the quarter because it's not a it's not a yearly thing it's a quarterly thing so it ends up being this like huge cost to a small business where in restaurants for example like your margin is nothing and you've got to figure out a way to keep these waiters and wait and people wonder why everything's going to kiosk it's because waiters and waitresses it's, it's not what they're getting paid they used to be paid more than what they're being paid now it's because if you over over like give them too many hours you have to offer them insurance and the insurance is not just like the difference between the 250 or whatever per hour they're supposed to be offered it's this huge additional increased cost to the company and it's not just the insurance it's the reporting mm -hmm. people don't realize how much reporting costs like and that's that's my bread and butter is is reporting so reporting is crazy it is mm. so freaking expensive to report and it's it's a it's a it, and the government also for the first three years that Obamacare went in, nobody knew what the reporting requirements were. Right. It was it yeah. was insane. Now I want to make sure I get a Sean's uh, response to that as well. How do you see a lot of these uh, problems being rectified in the future? Well, um, I, I think uh, we have fundamental disagreements on some of the economic issues, but. Um, <laughs> You know, I don't I, I used to libertarian bash a lot more, but I do have a lot of respect for those Ron Paul type libertarians, because I think like ultimately what Americans, no matter their political affiliation, has to have to realize is there's a reason it's a truism that empire eventually comes home. You look at history and, you know, uh, for example, the Fry Corps in uh, Germany that became the Nazis, those were World War I veterans. Uh, you know, uh, you see all these kind of traumatized soldiers who go off and fight these foreign wars eventually come home and then, hey, suddenly you need a guy who knows how to operate a gun and is not afraid to kill people. Well, that's going to be in demand in a, in, a, in a dire political climate. So, you know, kind awesome. of... Yeah, well, why I, <laughs> right. yeah. well, you know, and, and that's why, like, I've got, uh, I've got no problems. I, I, I take issue with John Stossel as a libertarian, because that guy had a fucking primetime show during the Iraq war. And for all his segments on government waste, you couldn't mention that war, buddy. 
you couldn't you couldn't yeah, uh, right. just do ro- one segment. I know I know the the homeless panhandlers are very scary, but uh, there's there's something going on over there by the Euphrates River. You might want to mention, um, but the actual oh, like yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. But the you know the actual like Ron Paul, let's say anti-intervention libertarians, I have plenty of respect for, and you know kind of what I'm saying here with my you know and even like the Pat Buchanan people who. Pat Buchanan wrote a book, A Republic, Shout Not an out. Empire. And he was, you know, it, it is pretty fascinating to me, you know, Pat Buchanan on the right, Bernie Sanders on the left. If you look at the 1990s, those two were right on most everything and actually agreeing on, you know, these trade deals. They were both against the Iraq war, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think there is space for people on both the right and the left who are against the empire and against intervention to come together because these economic questions that we all have to figure out, you know, democratically through debate amongst ourselves, like we're not going to get the option if we don't take care of the empire, because all this repression we're talking about, the possibility of a domestic terrorism law, the possibility mm-hmm. of, you know, just total deplatforming. This is all because of the empire. This is feeding the empire. There's, again, a reason the founders were and early Americans were for the longest time. There was no standing army here. And and that's because they were very wisely afraid that a standing army is a threat to liberty. And so I think that's just kind of like what we need to, in terms of do as a people, is set aside our disagreements, at least temporarily, and be like, okay, if we love liberty, love democracy, like the republic and the basic freedoms we enjoy, we have to begin a process of winding down this empire and at least, you know, stopping it from expanding further and slowly mm-hmm. kind of bringing it back down to something more manageable. Well, yeah, uh, Sean, Sean, wait, wait, I have, I have a quick question wait, there. Wait, I was yeah. going to so, say before okay. that, that really quickly, um, here at BTR, we are uh, creating the, the Red Brown Alliance. And apparently, yes. Sean, <laughs> you are a part of the Red Brown Alliance. So you are aligned with, uh, on your side, you got Red Scare. Mm-hmm. You got Amy Therese. God bless her soul. Um, hopefully she comes on one day. Um, and uh, on the other side, you got people like uh, Bronze Age Pervert, Moldbug, uh, people that I'm mm. more affiliated with. So we are on BTR creating the Red Brown Alliance right here. So yeah. uh, well, well I, I think, except, I think, except for the people, oh. uh, except for the people who uh, get money from uh, the Russian government and oh uh, God, go lad. and okay. uh, hey, go on can you guys, can you guys tell me what the Red Brown Alliance is? I'm so <laughs> that's going to be taken out of context. Sean, take it away. What is the Red Brown attack. Alliance? Oh boy. Yeah. Well, Brian, you were saying earlier you've never even seen a white supremacist. I have good news. According to my Twitter replies, you're looking at one right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, the Are Red they talking about my reflection or you? Oh no, me, me. <laughs> um, Wait, uh, where would you where would you say you stand politically? By the way, Sean, just so people were asking in the chat, like how would you identify if you had to pick uh, any label? Uh, I guess social like i here's the thing my my John. politics yeah i know labels are hard well let, someone... let me label you let me label yeah. you <laughs> sure sure i, I would Communist. label i would no no helicopter, no helicopter would... helicopter passenger <laughs> no i would label you as a mutualist yes. which is somebody that i get along with extremely well oh, so man. uh <laughs> and and i think that this is something that libertarians talk about quite a bit especially the anarchist libertarians that are kind of in my camp which is we will we would end up having sort of a mutualist i i think that this is how anarchy would sort of eventually kind of go to its its conclusion or whatever is these sort of mutualist societies but much smaller than what we what not 350 million people maybe a couple thousand people and you're part of x mutualist collective and i'm part of x mutualist collective and we would have some sort of way of of working out markets between each other but i think that you know Childeberg, I think, is a good example. This is very small, but it's like, you know, we this year we had 200 people there. Everything worked out perfectly. There's no issue. All I had to do was kind of push the balls, and everybody worked out great. We raised a bunch of money for freeross.org and stuff like that. But it's, and I think that's kind of the And, and I also designed the shirts with my father, that's by right. the way. And they're still mm. up. If you go to Childeberg.com, the, the shirts uh, designed by Lev Polyakov are up on Childeberg.com. And, and my father, Alexander Polyakov. Yes. Yeah, and also uh, I made this also this shirt, which is not available, which has the the Mothman from uh, Lev, and also the oh, uh, hold on, let me, uh, let me do a quick zoom in. 
here. Oh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So you can see we've got the Bigfoot and the Mothman. Oh, and, nice. And the nice. UFO. I made you guys got to raffle one of those shirts. It's it's good. It's that the, looks it's, amazing. Well, so far this is the only one that exists, but I made this my uh, my uh, leader of Schilderberg shirt because I, I was like, it, oh, man. this is super cool. Well, well, I'm gonna have to uh, find the. Uh, oh, thank you. Well, I want to find the bigger picture because I see Schilderberg three with the floating heads. But do you? Can you post a picture of the one with like all the characters or link me to it? Because I want to yes. post it in the chat. So, uh, but I want to get I'll, back. I'll, I'll, so, hey, Lev, I, I I actually need to hop off soon. I just wanted to give us uh, just. I, I've been sure. driving all day, so I, I apologize. Uh, we're oh no problem at all. We're, I, we're I just, on. I just, Mm -hmm, go ahead. I wanted to get your opinion, though, on one thing, which is something that we were talking about earlier. When it comes to what is the game plan of if now we don't have this uh, Soviet Union anymore, but we do have places like China and places like Russia, which I don't personally want them to start invading their neighbors, especially neighbors who have already had a taste of what freedom is and don't want to be enslaved by these people. So when it comes to that, what do you personally think is the right direction for a country like the United States to go on to at the same time make sure that we don't just, you know, uh, extract all the wealth from our citizenry while putting it into contractors and people who make use of all these tragedies while at the same time like where would our moral scope be when it comes to what do we do when because to the point of jake my only concern is saying okay fine let them take over they're gonna ruin uh, themselves anyway and then it'll be back to normal there's still going to be a lot of lives lost and a lot of uh, horrible things happening during that interim time that is the only reason why i would disagree with uh, jake's statement there but brian let me know what you think there well what i think the right way to move forward with any country and is I, I always tell people that i should write a book called just follow the instructions um the way you would deal with a, a subcontractor you, you have deliverables uh for them if you're going to invest money they have to meet those deliverables you have master service agreements which are hey you won't break this law this law this law and if they don't want to abide within that very basic framework of how they do business at the same time, you know, creating a profit for you, but also uh, delivering what they, you know, what they say, then you don't do business with them, plain and simple. Like, you know, what's going on with this Guatemala? Did she go to Guatemala or Honduras? I forgot, but uh, Kamala Harris. Um, Who's in Guatemala? Guatemala. You know, it's very simple. Like, hey, we're giving you a ton of money. We need a return on investment, plain and simple. And if they can't deliver it, you cut off the money, plain and simple. And so when people overthink and they're like, well, what about, uh, you know, their human rights and everything? Hey, that should be in the master services agreement. You want access to the U.S. banking system, the U.S. dollar. You abide by these, you know, these rules, which, mm -hmm. you know, are humane. But, you know, even rules that are humane, there is a certain and I don't want to sound inhumane in saying this, but there, there's profitability in certain humanitarian uh, policies. For instance, if people are scared to death to not work at a certain level, they're only gonna reach a certain level of effort. Whereas if people think they have hope in a future because they're working in a humane framework, you're gonna get a lot more out of them and you're gonna get innovation. And so by, you know, people will say, well, that sounds like nation building, we're exporting our uh, values and ethics. But yeah, hey, you know what, maybe we are, it's our money, you know? And if you don't wanna operate, yeah. Under our code of ethics, you don't operate with us. Go somewhere else, plain and simple. I, I think the problem, yeah. though, would to push back would be it does sound kind of like the old like Washington consensus thing that I think we should avoid. But I get what you're saying. I mean, I mean, if we're going to give money to these people, but um, it's but amazing go... though, Geo, really quickly. With oh, it's ahead. amazing the power of money, and 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 this wow. happened <laughs> yeah. under the last administration when they talked to. Uh, Guatemala. And they said, hey, you know what, we got a problem here. <clears throat> and you could hear Pompeo talking about this. And they're like, yeah, well, you know, we're, we're doing our best. And they said, we'll have it fixed by Tuesday, you know, or we're cutting off the money. Well, they had it fixed by Tuesday. And so the point, and it, it, you know, and even, even China was being, you know, for the first time in 40 years. And again, this is not to tout any candidate. I don't want this to get lost in the muck of, you know, everyday politics. But those policies in dealing with countries like China and Guatemala were sound because they were based on money and they reacted to them. And, and that's the proof in the pudding right there. They were like, okay, all right, fine, we will do this. And, and that's how you get, you know, hoping people espouse your values. 
I don't care if they espouse our values, mm. but they better show in their actions that they are not vi- vi- making violations of our values or they lose our business. And, and it's that simple for me. And the last question, do you also think that, uh, and I agree that there are various instances of the war coming home, like Sean was talking about, when it comes to a lot of these problems that America creates, uh, it gets pushback. Do you also think, though, on the other side, that there is an instance of the war coming home in a slightly different way, where even if a big military industrialized uh, uh, country like the United States of America were to close itself up and become more isolationist, would that prevent the United States from in any way suffering blowback from certain other rising countries that would take advantage of that power gap in the world? Or would the United States be able to be like uh, Elysium in that movie by the same name? Well, I didn't watch the ending of that movie, but I assume that that wasn't great either. Well, I mean, I've never seen a, a futuristic movie where like the future looks that great anyways. Mm-hmm. There seem to be a lot of hot teenagers with like crazy martial arts skills, but <laughs> that's about it. Um, no, I mean, the I, teenagers I don't think... aren't even hot anymore in the, fu- in the ones they make now. Yeah. But that's... I don't think closing off is ever the right answer, especially now. That makes as much sense as... Um, you know, everyone turning in their weapons to reduce crime. Well, the people that are doing the crime are never going to turn in their weapons. And so, you know, we we are a globalized economy now. And I, I don't think you can decouple from that without, it'd be like ripping out a, a cancer that's like burrowed into your heart. But, you know, again, we can control our own laws. I, I don't think decoupling and isolationism is even logical at this point. But you, you as the, you know, basically the the contract provider um you as the the customer it's your rules i mean and people think it's an oversimplified view but it's really not people want to make money and and based on my view of things you know under i I think the last administration for all their other faults understood that like it's about money you know and okay how are they going to make money and they made it clear this is how you make money with us you don't do this you don't make money and so well, um, I don't know if yeah. I'm answering your question. But no, that, you are. I wouldn't say and, and it's not, all about money for everybody, though. For example, for the Russian government, I know what you're going to say, Gio, but for the Russian government, the leaders have been raised by a KGB mentality from the start. Their end goal, as was taught to them by their uh, higher ups, is the destruction of the West. That's something that they learned in school. That's something everybody learned in school back in the USSR. But the goal for them well, is to in classrooms that, that teach anymore. critical race theory, too. Yeah, that's yeah, well, so there well, we go. We're so Lev, every fucking time you mention but, Russia, just all, look yes. at what happens in the States. No, 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 no. But my my, well, my all, point, yes. all of the, all of that is irrelevant because sound money wins out over weak money and Bitcoin exists and that's the future. Uh, we're what going, are the numbers of Bitcoin, by the way? Doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. It, it doesn't, doesn't matter it, in a, a one month time frame. Definitely. Right. Exactly. My, my concern, not, my concern is still know, that the Ru- skeptical. Of my, my concern is that the Russians are still going to cut off their nose to spite their face. It doesn't it comes matter to the kind of deals they it, make. It, it, it doesn't matter as long as as long as enough nodes are running to uh, reinforce the network. It it doesn't matter. So you would have to have a fifty one percent attack in order to split. Bitcoin, and that is impossible at this point because the economic incentives are too high. So, it at at this point, I mean, like I run a I run a a pruned node, but I run a node. I know thirty or forty people who run pruned nodes. At this point, it's it's too late. Bitcoin is going to be the future. It is irrelevant what other people are doing as far as monetary policy because. Well, I wouldn't say irrelevant because they are, it is going to have impact, but Bitcoin is going to take over. It's going to be the money of the world, just like gold at some point did. Um, and we are going to move into a new future and the new future is going to be Bitcoin. And we are going to be able to establish distributed networks where people are able to do what like what Sean would probably like, which is like mutualism, where people are able to be taken care of despite whatever health issues they have or uh, productivity mm. issues they have. All of those types of things are going to be taken care of because the network is distributed. The internet exists. Bitcoin exists. It's too late. You can you can fight as much as you want. Federal Reserve. It's it's done. It, it's just like what you know. Cody uh, Cody Wilson said this with uh, 3D printing guns, where he said the debate is over. 
it exists. What are you going to do now? We can still print, we can print guns. We can also manufacture money and mm-hmm. the money is distributed. It doesn't matter. Well, a lot of these, a lot of these arguments and stuff like that are in the past and they're fun to have, but at the same po- time, it's too late. Well, to, to be fair, they're still in the present right now when people are getting arrested in Russia for criticizing the government and sentenced sure. to like eight years in prison. Well, I mean, so on, on, on a, too you're right. On, a, on like an in, there, yeah, on an individual level, you're right. It, it is. Oh, Brian, you got to go. So thank you so <laughs> I, much for I being do, here. I do. And I, I hate to, uh, Jake, I did follow you. Uh, Sean, I followed you as well. Uh, hope you, I want to talk to both of you again offline. All right, see you, my friend. Want to pick your brain about Bitcoin. Uh, love your website, Sean. It's awesome. And for yes, everyone listening, Go to Sean's website. It's really, really, uh, really a good read. Um, I do want to say something to Sean's point, and and that is what I liked hearing was he's working things out with his neighbor. And I, I do think right now the the state we're in, and no one could deny we're in a, a crazy state here. Um, it does feel like the divisiveness is really being pushed on us. The reason I drive all over this country, which seems insane to people, and I'm not independently wealthy, it's just that I realize you don't need that much money to really have a good life. Um, we drive to every state and we meet every single person we can. And every time we do that, people are like, oh, wow, you're from New York. You're not trying to make me get an abortion, (laughs) you know, that sort of thing. So I I really say to people all the time, and you guys know this, but to everyone else who's spending too much time in front of the screen, get away from the screen once a day, go out, meet someone new, because things aren't that bad. They just want you to think they are. And, um, you know, oh, yeah. so certainly you'll see if you go to my YouTube, which um, uh, I investigate everything, sorry. Um, but that's why I'm always outside. I'm like, do new things. I'm throwing an axe. I'm doing the remote control car. Um, I won't post a video of the remote control car taking out my son because it was tragic, but funny. Um, but the point is, like, do new things. And I love that. I mean, I love that. I love meeting everyone. We were watching chickens last week and I put a video out about it and people are a lot happier when they're outside plain and simple yeah and so I would just encourage everyone and you know anyone not anyone but you guys by invitation only you know and Lev you know your invitations there uh, so oh, is yours you. to you when you can mm. figure out a way o- across the border. Oh, uh, my country. Uh, yeah, esca- yeah, escaping was, that uh, uh, autocracy. Well, I, was, Ford's, I was just going to say, uh, you know, yeah. um, I look forward to to Lev coming up and, you know, getting in the kayaks and throwing some axes and oh, yeah. showing me some new stuff, you know, and, and things like that and, and going down to, you know, the new new house, which I'm sure is wonderful. Um, but, you know, get out and, and, you know, hold on to your communities as much as you can, your real communities, not your, not your Twitter communities, like your real communities, because well, we can turn one to the other. Yeah. That's where, well, well, that's, that's where like, just talking like this is great, you know, just talking Absolutely. like this is great. So, um, I, I really thank you for having me on. And, uh, if you guys send me questions or want to continue the discussion, I'm really happy to, I really learned a lot from everyone here. Um, and it's always a pleasure. Lev. I, I really appreciate being on the show. I really appreciate you, Brian, being in the show. Everybody, follow Brian O'Shea, S-P-I, on Twitter, please. Look at his stuff. It's uh, it's Uh, wonderful. Yeah. All right. Thank you you so much. Thank you, my friend. All right. Have Um, a good one, guys. You too. Take care. Nice meeting you. You you as well. Thanks. I I just want to change the screen, by the way, to uh, look at this uh, beautiful imagery that uh, uh, Sean was capturing of uh, people. Actually, did you capture this footage of people with the bull holding the bull's balls? In, oh, that uh, was my, my co-host, Yogi Polly Wall, yes. I, I set up I a saw, camera I saw there. That. It was pretty good. Yeah. yeah. But so and Sean, and, I, and you, uh... I'm a huge fan of that bowl, too, because I, I've got it oh, all. Well, I don't have it over. I don't have it on the screen, but I've, I've got that all over my room. <laughs> Wait, there so, were like uh... multiple bowls. One of the <laughs> other originals. Yeah, they're like some billionaire owns another one of the bulls. I think he has it on a yacht floating somewhere in the Pacific. <laughs> well, you know, in, in California, in California, where I'm from, there is a uh, so there's a bear, which is the the pair for the bull in New York. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's in it's in the Bay Area in California, where I'm from. And I, I, I actually prefer the bear to the bull because I'm, I'm from California. But uh, but I, I like it a lot. I, I always switch out the bowl in in like my decorations. I always switch it out for a bison because I feel like it's more American. Interesting. Yeah, I, I haven't seen the bear, but I want to check it out. Yeah, it's, it's in it's in like the San Francisco Bay Area. I can't remember where specifically, but uh, I've got some pictures there. It's it's pretty cool. 
Of course, there's also uh, Bobo the Bear from uh, 4chan's Biz, for those uh, who know about uh, Bobo and what he's all about. He's one of my favorite meme characters, you know, being very happy about the current state of the market right now with uh, oh, the way Bitcoin's going. You know, he's very, so, um, very proud. My, my favorite meme was posted by uh, Marquita Passad, which was um, a pink Wojak edit of uh, what's that movie, Come and See, and the Bogdanoff guy oh, was yeah, behind yeah, that was him. A good one. <laughs> Amazing. But no, you didn't answer. Um, so, Sean, are you a communist? Uh, are you communist right now? Um, no. So what is your political belief? But also um, just generally your view of American foreign policy going forward, what it should be, what it will be. And also Bitcoin. I guess we have to ask you that question. And I want to ask you a very personal, uh, well, not very personal, but personal question about a certain someone that we interact with on Twitter. Um, but for, yeah, so are you, uh, what is your political beliefs, foreign policy, Bitcoin? Um, I mean, I, I would certainly consider myself on the left though. I think, you know, I've articulated uh, online plenty, my problems with the current left in the United States, mm. the United Kingdom. I mean, like, I guess people could just call me anti woke left, but that doesn't really tell you what I actually think on economic issues. Um, post I, left is not another I, adequate term. Or? Yeah. I don't like that term. I mean, like, if I were to right now in my thinking, if I were to attempt to define it, I'd be somewhere between a social Democrat and a Maoist third worlder. I've, nice. I've synthesized. Nice. See, I, I, the, I was, I was the right. Most based form of communism. Yes. In my opinion. I, I was right about the Rousseau thing, I guess. But and for yeah. those who don't know, the red Brown Alliance is this like scare term that the coalition of uh, woke media people with the verified accounts and Chapo people, Chapo Ironist, they use, um, to denote these sort of disenfranchised economic left people that don't mind um, conversing with people like me who are considered quote unquote far right. Uh, they, so it's like the brown shirts, the red shirts. They, they, they say like, they call Sean a Strasserite mm -hmm. and all this crap. And it's just, mm. yeah. So, well, are you, would you say that you're close to like Chapo trap house, that kind of dirtbag left uh, type of deal or not really? Yeah, I mean, um, the, they were, uh, I, I, I don't, uh, like, I don't know them on a, a personal basis, but Matt Christman has done our podcast a couple times, and I've talked with Felix. Uh, they're, they're good dudes. I've got nothing oh, I'm but sorry respect for insulting them. them just then. Oh, it's <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's sorry. Um, no, but, no, but, but you, you, know, you, like, you, you yeah. Well, we have our political disagreements, but I think of them more as entertainers. And honestly, I think of like myself as an entertainer primarily, you know, like I tell people my opinions, but I'm not going to get up in my panties if they don't agree with me. You know, I'm, I'm just here to hopefully mm. make people laugh or at least think about things. Well, do you think you that do... you've, uh... oh, go, go on. Uh, I was going to say you're, you're a stand up comedian. Yeah. Uh, what is, what, uh, do you want to plug your stuff? Because I messaged you because I run a uh, music and comedy show. And awesome. even though I'm har our, our music and comedy show is hardcore libertarian. I think, well, well at least I'll be able to get well. weed after, huh? Uh, <laughs> oh, and, and weed, weed and mushrooms. So, yeah. uh, and probably LSD if, uh, <laughs> if you stick around, oh, but, man. uh, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, like fully automatic assault rifles. <laughs> well, that also <laughs> a fully assembled lower, uh, yeah, yeah. at least. So, uh, but well, yeah. the I mean, well, this is that, one that I found. What I they all to. have their serial numbers. Don't worry about it. Yeah. No, no, no. no. Well, Fully assembled lower. We don't do. We don't do that shit. Oh no. So this, See, this is my number one YouTube <laughs> result. But this is actually me bombing at a roast battle. <laughs> bombing? No, you were great. What are you talking about? You weren't bombing. You you had a great job there. Yeah. I thought your jokes are were you really part funny. Of, like, did you sort of give up stand up to be a podcaster? Or do you still do the occasional stand up? Well, it was like. I mean, I'll tell you, I love stand up comedy. It's like my passion. It's like, you know, you pick the one thing you want to do with with your limited time on this earth. Mm -hmm. For me, it's stand up comedy. And I uh, did it in Seattle. I moved out to here to New York and I ran my head against a wall for six or seven years, like trying to get somebody in the industry to give me a tap on the shoulder and nothing. And then mm -hmm. I started the podcast and, you know, I'm like, in terms of size, we're an also ran compared to the Chapo and the Red Scare, but we have a, a small little dedicated fan base. And it's just one of those things with like with live performance now, you've got to put stuff on the internet. It doesn't yeah. matter what 
Mm. It is, you know, you can put a podcast, you can put uh, video sketches, you can put, you know, uh, writing on a sub stack or whatever the case may be. You're just going to get you, so many more eyeballs if you just put stuff on the internet. So for me, podcasting is just a way of like, I want to have an audience so that I can do stand up. You need to have an audience to do stand up. So I do a podcast, yeah. but I, you know, podcasting is fun. It's just not as good as stand up for me. We got to work. What are, gotta, what are some work of the, on you oh. coming out to Childerberg for? Hell yeah. Doing, All right. Uh, uh, hit me up on Twitter. I'm in. I, I, me- I message you. We're, we're, we'll work on it because I think, right. I think our audience, because we get a lot of, well, it's, it's libertarian, but it's mostly just anarchists. So we have a lot of left anarchists, right anarchists. Uh, I think they try to like burn down style. the event every time they go. There. <laughs> yes. I, you, it worked, you know what? It works out awesome. This year we had 200 people. Uh, Robbie the Fire was our headliner comedian. Oh, Robbie and, the Fire yeah. Bernstein. Yeah, with and, Dave Smith. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's he's Dave's uh, co-host. He was our headliner comedian this year, and um, it worked out really well. Everybody was super cool. And then yeah. afterward, we went back to the campsite, beer, wine, mead, mushrooms, nice weed, mead. LSD. Everything was great. So beautiful. Yeah. yeah. By the way, there is a there is a, there is a if, connection if there too. The, yeah. Just with uh with uh Robbie the Fire Bernstein, Dave Smith, Dave Smith to Louis J. Gomez, uh Lu- being one of the uh, Legion of Skanks to you because Louis J. Gomez announced you on that Rose Battle stage. So there yes. we go. It's a very it's a very small world. I actually keep having dreams, believe it or not. Like one of my, my most frequent dreams, and I've written down like two hundred pages worth of dreams already in my journal. But one of my most frequent dreams is being uh, going to a comedy club, going to a comedy festival. It just keeps recurring, just because I love going there and i'll be honest like i don't know what the hell you were talking about with you bombing i saw that rose battle and i was laughing out loud i, I was actually watching it today i was laughing out loud at a lot of the uh comebacks that you were uh that, that you were throwing out to your friend so oh, i thought that good. you did a you did like the one about the uh the, the space needle uh, that was one of my favorites mm-hmm. and also uh who say he looked like uh now I'm, I'm not gonna say it you guys have to watch it and then you're gonna appreciate it because it's a really good video but as far as uh political inspirations though who do you say like which books did you say inspired you in the current worldview that you hold now Uh, i mentioned devil's chessboard by david talbot and i would also recommend um the road to 9 11 by peter dale scott I, i think like Peter Dale Scott is my hero right now. Um, and I've been going through his work, but it's, it's like very dense. So mm. you have to have like, you know, I think start with the devil's chessboard and that'll give you mm. like a bit of a background on kind of the national security state. And then his entire task has been to document this national security state classified history. Um, and, and so if you're, if you're ready for it and you want to dive in, but he also gives good interviews and the, the documentary, I, I discovered him through this documentary called counterintelligence. Um, it's free online somewhere. Um, but that's just kind of, it goes over the, it's like, I think five or six parts talks about the CIA talks about operation Gladio and in, in Italy mm-hmm. and Europe and yeah. such. And he's interviewed for that. And that's, that's how I discovered his work. And that's national security. And what about uh, when it comes to economics? Who would you say would be the uh, big inspirations for you? Uh, it's been a lot of different things at this point. Um, I like, uh, I'm trying to think of an economist. You know who I really like is Dean Baker. I mean, he's just kind of like, I guess people would say he's stand, uh, maybe kind of a standard liberal, but he's I don't think so. He's the one who really got me to, ch- to change my mind on, on trade with China, you know, the WTO and all that, um, because I got an economics degree when I graduated college. And, you know, you mm. learn all trade is win win. Everybody benefits. There's no losers or, you know, or there's like a very small group of losers, but they get complimented there. They get they get uh, it made up to them because the benefits are so huge. And um and he's the one who kind of went through and documented this stat I, I gave earlier. That's his stat about twenty percent of all U.S. manufacturing jobs disappear from two thousand to two thousand seven, and that's as compared to one percent disappeared between nineteen eighty and two thousand. So it is mm. like you know a massive collapse in manufacturing, and the only thing that it lines up with is China getting PNTR with yeah. the and, uh, the United States. And how do you think um, America? 
what do you see that the foreign policy is going to go forward? Maybe not just in terms of China, but also like, what will be your vision for America sort of getting out of the various like impossible situations it's in either the Middle East or in the, or in, you know, the Far East or wherever. Um, and also like we have to get to Bitcoin, obviously that's like the hot topic, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously it's a case by case, but um, I, I think actually like going insane on the JFK assassination has been pretty good for me uh, because <laughs> because like, look, honestly, it's a fundamental question in terms of the history of the United States is was there or was there not a military coup in the United States? And I've, you know, the more I looked at it, the more I was like, yeah, you know, as much as I hate to admit cringe, Bill Hicks was right. And I was wrong when I was a kid. Oh, yeah, oh, He was, uh, no, I was, I actually did get into stand up because of Bill Hicks, but he can be a little, a little yeah, too much. A little too much. Uh, but yeah, um, just like a certain Alex Jones. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, I'm glad he, I'm glad he changed politics and has a new career now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, I mean like the thing with JFK and how I've come to understand the assassination is there was in the United States at that time, two schools of thought um, regarding the Soviet union. And that's, coexistence where they say these nations that's the soviet sphere these nations that's our sphere we stay out of your nations you stay out of our nations and then these other nations are let's say the non-aligned movement they're neutral we both stay out of those you know and then you kind of carve the world up that way and then hopefully everybody obeys their obligations and maybe you yeah. kind of go back and forth on that and that was one school of thought and then the other school of thought was conquest destroy the soviet union which is eventually what won out they did they elected reagan and they did destroy the soviet mm. union and so good uh, yeah i know um, so to quote feature lamont from sopranos um what's yours is yours Polly. what's mine and mine what what isn't um what isn't either of us is can be anybody else's sort of deal like mm. yes yeah, sort of i mean but hopefully with like some sort of agreements uh to prevent to provide stability in the world order to protect the sovereign borders of individual nation states to avoid wars of aggression those sorts of things um but you know like yeah they destroyed the soviet union but i think the blowback uh, peter dale scott talks about this is you know in the carter and reagan administration uh, there is a bit of talk about how we funded al-qaeda when they the russians invaded afghanistan and then that mm -hmm. blows back on us mm -hmm. but we were actually like according to peter dale scott and funding terrorism within the soviet union like we were not only defending uh, funding uh, these uh, domestic fighters within afghanistan we were to various degrees trying to get terrorist groups to go into soviet border states and actually like cause the problems in particular yeah 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 where and where could i uh, read about that particular part by the way when you're talking I, about america funding uh terrorists into the soviet union in the road to 9 11 by peter dale scott he discusses this and it's you know obviously it's a contentious controversial topic but i can certainly yeah. get back to you well, the, on, the only thing i wanted to add also oh, wait, from, real, real quick real quick from, the only thing that i want to add there is that people talk about after the soviet union was uh, disillusioned how a lot of you know there's this impression that uh the uh, america and other countries were like uh ravenous birds picking at the corpse of the ussr the other interpretation is that during that time, the USSR, or former USSR, was actively sending out all of its old Soviet weaponry to third world nations. But the other part that doesn't get discussed as much is that while the USSR was still functioning, it was the main supplier of a lot of these third world countries as far as weaponry. So it's not like mm -hmm. it all of a sudden started doing it after it fell apart. It was doing it this whole entire time. That was uh, one of the ways that it made money, as well as in uh, well, the drug but then, trade. But the counterpoint that. would be that there was literally an orgy of violence that happened in the 1990s and early 80s when the Soviet Union dissolved, because then you had a lot of these uh, predatory um, oligarchs that were basically merchanting like mass death, like scale, like death on a mass scale for their own profit out of the crumbling 
ashes of these Soviet weapons. Well, well, here's stocks, an example, so. by the way. Here, here's an example of this. So in 1992, Vladimir Putin was investigated, and this is from the Bureau Invest Investigates.com. Uh, Putin was investigated for a deal he oversaw while an official in the mayor's office. Uh, my mom actually got to meet him when she was asking for directions for... But anyway, uh, the deal involved the export of $100 million... Maybe he's your dad. Who knows? Oh! Of 100... Of 100... No uh, wonder Love uh, hates him so much. Oh! <laughs> okay. Export of 100 million worth of raw materials in exchange for food for the citizens of St. Petersburg. The materials were exported, but the food never arrived. So the point that I'm getting to here is that he was basically taking in all this material that back then countries like the United States, who even used to refer to it as, uh, what was it, like the uh, George Bush uh, chicken legs. These, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this aid that was sent that uh, most of it never even materialized for uh, the people and they went hungry. So as far as who to point the finger at, it would be Putin, who I would also point the finger at, at funding various podcasters out there in the United States that shill on behalf of Russia. But I'm not going to get into that well, too love, much. Well, I encourage they, you they to do watch all... the latest Keith so, Woods video on the let me, let me give you but... Let me give you some of, like, the uh, deplorable right-wing anarchist... Uh you know, positions, I guess, on this is that uh, Scott Horton, who is, I think, one of the greatest experts on on foreign policy, uh, Enough Already, and um, what's his other book? Um, Enough Already and Fool's Errand, where he kind of goes through how a lot of this stuff kind of coalesced in the, the 90s and early 2000s and stuff like that, is uh, a lot of this is due to America's foreign policy as a result of um, them trying to combat the Soviet Union, which was inflated by the military industrial mm -hmm. complex uh, to, so, you know, a, a lot of the, so from a libertarian perspective, especially like a free market uh, perspective, the Soviet Union was DOA and it would have, it would have collapsed in five, 10 years or whatever. But Again, to sort of reiterate this is there were multiple socialists from the United States who visited the Soviet Union and they looked at all of their manufacturing capacity and every single one of their machines said made in Detroit, made in Chicago, made in New York. The United States funded the Soviet Union. And that is the issue is that the United States funded for multiple reasons and you can look into these reasons um, Scott Horton has has thousands of episodes of his podcast to explain like why a lot of this stuff happened. But um, the United States participated in the Soviet Union's continuation for a hundred years, nearly, and it was because there was other interests, which was oil, gold, paper, a lot of these different types of things that the the czarist russia was producing and it made american industrialists way more wealthy to have no czarist russia exist and to have that sort of avenue of industrialism cut off so maybe the soviet union would have could, existed and continued in some sort of like scandinavian style socialist sort of thing mm -hmm. but the European oligarchs and the American oligarchs funded the Leninist, Stalinist progression toward this sort of totalitarian Russian government that killed millions of Ukrainians, killed millions of Russians and other types of ethnic groups that were not considered, well, um, you know, yeah, even, beneficial. Um, Anthony C. Sutton wrote this. Um, Sean, are you familiar with this? What is your opinion about like the works of Sutton and others who say that the uh, oligarchical class was actually um, like, I think the book was called Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution. Mm. Um, I, are you familiar with that type of book? I, I've, I've heard about it. I haven't read the book though. Yeah, I, it's plausible. I mean, it's, it's um, I, I think that, but then that would extend, I guess, to the, the mindset of um, geopolitics being theater proper in, in sort of the the grand chessboard the theory of people like um yeah i i, I see i see i see sort of that argument of it but i also think if you just follow the money for it is that it it just kind of shows that this is not only plausible but just the way it worked mm. out i don't think it's like i again 
I, I try to like point out, I don't think this is like a grand conspiracy where like, you know, the Rockefellers and, you know, the Rothschilds are like, ha, ha, ha. like we've yeah. got to move these chess pieces around. I think it's just, it's just a follow the money thing. If you are a corporatist and you have, you know, general electric or whatever, it makes a lot more sense for your bottom line to have a guaranteed, you know, hundred thousand dollar check at the end of the year than it does to try to figure out how to compete with your competitors. And I think that's kind of what was going on during Tsarist Russia was you had, you had American oil, you know, interests competing against Russian oil interests and you had American banking interests competing against the, the, the gold holdings of Tsarist Russia which was, you know, Zara, you know, and, and we can all see this is that Tsarist Russia was much, much more delayed getting to a sort of centralized banking system than Western Europe. Uh, we really, as far as like Western European and American interests, we were so far advanced as far as like those interests go compared to Tsarist Russia that if you, if you were JP Morgan Chase or if you were, you know, Rockefeller or, you know, any of these types of sort of oligarchs, the the best solution for you as far as your yearly bottom line was to get rid of Tsarist Russia. And that's what they did. I don't think that it's necessarily like we're going to think 20 years in the future and see what's going on. It's, it's reactionary to your yearly bottom line. And that's sort of the issue. It's is kind that of when, like... Mm -hmm. Go oh, for sorry, it. Go ahead. No, no, I no, was going to say it's, it's kind of like um, getting rid of all the old empires in places like Indochina. And so the yes. funding Viet Minh and yeah. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, America was kind of arriving on sort of the scene as far as being the new world empire. And uh, it, I think it's sort of as far as corporate interests go, which, you know, from an anarchist perspective, you know, the cathedral is corporate interests merged with the government. It's the same thing as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's that a lot of these companies through the free market enterprise system got to a certain level and then they realized they were had they had to compete. I mean, you see this with uh, oil industry in the United States where when kerosene was invented and then they tried to do all the things that the school teaches us that they do where they're like, oh, we're going to take over this. We're going to undercut the oil, we're going to take a loss for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. But what actually happens is that entrepreneurs go, oh, they're selling at below market price. Let's just buy all of it and store it up. And then when they raise prices, we'll just open up again. And that's what happened. You it, And you can see it in product after product after product. Uh, Tom Woods does a lot of really good research on this is matches, kerosene, um, any sort of oil products, any sort of steel products, any sort of wood products, the price just continued to go down dramatically all through the Gilded Age. And then when prices started rising again was as a result of Gilded Age oligarchs joining up with the government and preventing new people from entering the market. That's always the issue. And one of the key parts of preventing that is funding the Soviet Union. And it cut off wood, it cut off oil, it cut off gold, it cut off silver, it cut off all of these different industries that Tsarist Russia was championing, and not even higher than the United States, just championing it enough that it was a portion of well, the Well, they market had a pretty share. good economy, like during yeah. the time that this all went down. But what I want to get to here is that when it comes to the USSR, and as somebody who was uh, from there originally, the problems that I uh, see with that kind of model, what I'm curious from your perspective, point of view sean is is since you are more socialist leaning uh would you have any concerns with giving the government as much power as to you know have them be able to undertake the similar things that the ussr was doing at the time well i think people should understand that the united states today i mean uh, the the term inverted totalitarianism i think describes it pretty well um yeah, we wait, do what have kind of totalitarianism Inverted totalitarianism. I, I pilfered that from Chris Hedges, who pilfered yeah. it from a different political scientist who is now dead, who I forgot the name of. Um, 
but I- inverted totalitarianism the basic idea is like it's not like a traditional totalitarian system where they'll throw you in prison if you criticize the government you have free speech you have free assembly you can vote in an election it's just literally nothing you do can challenge corporate can, power or matter yeah yeah or yeah it doesn't matter like none of that speech none of that assembly none of that voting it doesn't make a difference the system rolls on so you live under inverted totalitarianism and, and what i would say in like in terms of the united states soviet model Model, I think what has happened with the Wall Street banks is kind of the worst of both worlds, where these are, quote unquote, private corporations, but they have an infinite government money backstop, yep. you know, BlackRock yep. and uh, JP Morgan and all this. These are, for all intents and purposes, they are already government entities, but they have no public input. So I would just say like people who are sometimes you, you see the fear of people who don't want to use the state to rectify these problems caused by corporations. And what I would say to them is essentially it's all there already. Like, they, but, compare, but compared to what, though? That's the thing that always gets me. It's like that Churchill quote about democracy being a horrible system, oh, but better than anything else out there. I know, boomer, cringe, no, cringe, cringe, no, no, no. You're, cringe. You're not, I mean, like, no, you're not. But Sean is right, is that is that maybe we fought against the Soviet model for 50, 60 years or whatever. That's what we are at right now, is that is there although it does not seem that way, is that the ultimate conclude? Actually, a really good quote on this is that America won World War II, but fascism won America. Yeah, I agree and with that, that. That's what, that's what we're at right now. Well, is if that, only fascism won America, but that's... Oh, go ahead. Chad. Yeah, well, no, no, no. Like, first off, you are right. Things can always get worse, and it is important to be aware of that. Um, you know, like we could, none of us wants to live through actual system collapse. Like that would wow. be a nightmare. Uh, you know, even if things like get better 20 years down the line or maybe it's historically necessary, maybe it has to happen, but, but regardless, things can always get worse, but also like, just kind of like, look at the way the U S is structured. Like we were saying where the government and multinational corporations can kind of be th- thought of as one big entity. And what they do is they divide up spheres. So ostensibly, when, when you say free speech, people say it's not free speech if the government's not censoring you. Private corporations can do what they want. Yeah. Well, so the, the government just outsources their censorship to these private corporations and technically we're pretending these are two separate things but what about you know like killing you with a police officer or with you know a cia assassin well private corporations can't do that but the government can certainly do it so it's like you have this this whole yeah but 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 to to, to to sort of to sort of uh reinforce that argument or is that if you have some sort of grievance against Facebook, how much does it cost you to fight that grievance against Facebook or Google or whoever? Mm -hmm. And how much does it cost Google as a percentage of their net worth? And as a, to go through a supposedly equal justice system, you're paying, you know, multiple times more of your net worth to fight whoever. But Facebook is like, it's nothing to them. It's like, it's not equal justice. And libertarians have been arguing this for, you know, 50 years is that we have a, we have equality under the law. That's not true. How, how Ross Ulbricht is a great example. This this is the, this is the uh, sort of charity kind of object that we at Childerberg try to kind of give toward Ross Ulbricht started Silk Road. Silk Road was funded by Bitcoin. Maybe we'll we'll get back to Bitcoin about this a, a little bit. Uh, but the FBI agents that were involved with pro, like finding evidence and prosecuting Ross Ulbricht, they're all in jail because mm. of corruption. And yet Ross Ulbricht has double life plus forty. And and oh, has was it dread no, by Ross? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 And and yet. There's no other recourse at this point. The Supreme Court has d- denied hearing the appeal. At this point, the only possibility of getting him out is a presidential pardon. How is that equal justice? Hmm. I it's agree not. there. Yeah. But as, but as far as I, uh, I agree there, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to call it a night in a minute, though. 
All right. Well, before All you right. call it a night, I just want to, I have one final question for you, uh, Sean. What I'm curious about is other than saying like, I'm going to be neutral. It's a shitty situation. What we have with this corporatocracy, but as far as fixing it, is there any particular reason why you would lean more on giving the government more control over a lot of these facets? Uh, but Lev, it's uh, you're, it's kind of a reductionistic way. Either the government does it, or, or I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Well, no. If they, sorry, if go there ahead, is Sean. Certain, he has limited yeah. time, so go ahead, Sean. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's that's right. Where essentially, again, to to get back to what we were just saying, there, the it's it's like a headspace thing where we're pretending these multinational corporations are separate from the government when in reality they're acting in tandem and the one does sure. what the other can't. There's a great, actually, um, Michael uh, Lewis, the guy who wrote um, uh, Moneyball and about the uh, the financial crisis that they made that movie out of. Um, he wrote a, a book called Flash Boys about flash traders. And there was like an interesting little anecdote in there. It's about high frequency trading. It's an interesting book. But the anecdote was there was an employee at, I think it was Goldman Sachs. Uh, I could be wrong on the exact bank, but he was a high frequency trader there. And he like left to go work at a competing firm. And then the bank immediately ran to the FBI and said, hey, he stole this proprietary code. And suddenly he is hit with felony charges for stealing proprietary code from Goldman Sachs. He, of course, did not. He never stole any prior, uh, you know, any proprietary code whatsoever. It was a complete bullshit prosecution that, you know, federal charges you're spending a quarter of a million dollars in lawyers fighting it off and it entirely happened because goldman sachs is a powerful entity and it's a corporation that when they put on their little corporate hat oh we're a corporation we can't put people in jail but we can call up our buddies at the government who are going to come join this board later you know it, these these entities can use each other to pretend that they are separate spheres, but in reality, they're always acting in tandem and they're always, you know, working towards a common goal Absolutely. that is shared because yeah. they, they go back and forth. So essentially, like when I talk about, you know, the government solving this or that, I'm more just trying to introduce some mechanism of democratic or public accountability. Because when you have, a let's say, a corporate boardroom of, of 12 and uh, let's say it's amazon or whatever you can't boycott amazon you they the aws the web like any website you go to you're supporting amazon you know that they're they're so ubiquitous that yeah. i don't think that kind of mechanism works it's it, you can't really just pick a c competitor um so i think you need to have the government or have the public have some sort of input or law into this and just kind of open things up and make them more transparent and make it so that local communities have a voice and people are able to decide these issues democratically. Well, even like Google is pretty much the surface web in, yeah. in a lot of ways. And yeah. what can you do with that, really? Um, well, I, I, I think I think Bitcoin yeah. solves a lot of these issues and maybe we'll get into this uh, shortly. But I, I think that's really the issue is that the government currently... Uh, in in conjunction with corporations controls the money supply and a decentralized money supply where it is uh i guess to use sort of a, le a leftist i guess uh terminology is uh a democratically arrived at money supply mm -hmm. is going to solve a lot of these issues because if you do not have the federal reserve bailing you out then we have the ability to bankrupt corporations like Amazon or Google or whoever uh, because they are not acting in a, I, again, to, to borrow a democratic uh, word, they're not acting in a democratic fashion. Mm. People do not want to be censored. And I think without the sort of monetary inflationary practices by the Federal Reserve Bank, we would not see this to the extent that we're seeing it now. I wish... I wish that there could be a balance here of seeing like all these corrupt things that all of us are seeing. None of us want them. None of us want the censorship. None of us want all these multinational corporations to have all this control. At the same time, I also see what people are capable of. And we've seen what people are capable of in history. 
and mm. I lean on having a vertical wow. kind of elite that can set a certain tone that are people of merit. As far as how mm -hmm. to go about that, I don't know. All I know is that there are plenty of tricksters out there and plenty of swindlers that would put on the face of being somebody that is for the people. And anytime they say they are for the people, a raised flag is raised within my head because I fear, shit, maybe this motherfucker, well, you know, has something up their sleeve. Yeah. Speaking of swindlers, last question. Not to drag up any drama, Sean. Hmm. Maybe, what am I kidding? Uh, what is your opinion on a certain... Uh, son of a certain defense contractor that we interact with on Twitter uh, oh, a month ago. You absolutely just shredded him a month ago. Uh, what is your opinion on our good friend Crumpler? Um, just to close oh, off. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know his deal, but it's just like so funny to me to like literally make your money that lets you sit in a fucking <laughs> air conditioned apartment of you know, blowing Yemeni weddings apart because my dad was dropping cluster bombs on those malnourished uh, fishermen who were just trying to, you know, like this, like, I mean, nobody chooses their parents, true, but true. if I was the actual, like, let's say Klaus Barbie was my father and I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to get on the internet and lecture people about yeah. how they don't, you know, really like this is uh, worse than Auschwitz or something. Yeah. Or, you know, Not sufficiently anti, yeah. Anti fascist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. I want to get on the internet and be, an, uh, be like, pro germany when my dad was a nazi or something <laughs> I, the analogy is imperfect but you can see where i'm going here now i yeah. like i don't i don't have any problem i never had any problem with the guy it just the the arrogance and the dismissiveness and the fact that he just calls everybody fascist or racist or whatever or the himself, fuck it's like big... yeah yeah it, it's like you know, I worked for a living. I and plenty of people I know who like this guy is called a fucking fascist. Work for a living, and if uh, if you got to play act as an academic because your dad blew people up, I would maybe at least be be a little more respectful in debates oh, and man. and try to try to dialogue it's instead true. of immediately going to these these stupid ad hominems. But apparently, we, we, we've got to get we've got to get you out to Childeberg, Sean. I think, <laughs> oh yeah. I think you're going to be, I think your standup is going to do extremely well with our crowd. Yeah. Uh, and apparently well, being a working class, that's I, racial. I, I, I DM, songs, I, so. yes. Oh yeah. I DM'd you on Twitter. Let's, let's work it out. I think we'll, we'll fly you and, out. And who knows, maybe Sean's going to become libertarian after hanging yeah. out in Childerberg and doing a lot of LSD with. Uh, yeah. I mean, we do, we've got a lot of left wing lip like anarchists that show up. So I think, I think it'll work out. I think your, your yeah. standup will do. Mm, yeah it'll be good <laughs> yeah if you're if you're in the chat come to childeberg you can see my stand-up oh, yeah. and then you can see me freak out on a mushroom trip for six hours uh, <laughs> that's absolutely that's absolutely true uh, I, wait i thought I, I thought you were a pro you're not a mushroom pro you haven't uh... I, I only took them once i I'll took mushrooms you, and lsd once so i i so this always happens at childeberg is I don't ever do anything while I'm there because I'm the organizer. So right, I try right. to like, uh, try to make sure everything's okay. I always arrive back at my house with more shit to get fucked up on than like <laughs> I could possibly want. Right. I arrived with like a year's worth of mushrooms <laughs> at my house. <laughs> and I was, I was out walking, uh, my dogs the other day and I was like, yeah, I'll take like a cap and then like, just kind of like walk my dogs and whatever the amount of ROUSs that I saw was crazy are you are is anybody have familiar with rous's rodents rodents of unusual size <laughs> oh god yeah interdimensional oh, rats that are just kind of like messing with me while i'm walking my dogs and like that's that's the that's the vibe of chillerberg except for for me it's the vibe when i come back because i don't imbibe in anything while i'm there so huh? oh god You've well I have, by the way I, I have the I have the perfect picture for what you just said right now, uh, Jake. Here it is. Look, look at this God, thing of beauty. That's terrible. <laughs> yeah. I, I hate this image. Yeah. What a Lev, perversion Lev, of that meme. We've got to get you out, Lev, because I think yeah. I think it'll just be fun. Like I'll, I mean, I'll I, I don't do psychedelics anymore, but I would definitely love to uh, go. And one final question yeah. for for Sean. Go for do it. Do you uh, would you say you are a finished book? 
or do you think you're just starting on your journey right now as far as who Sean McCarthy is and who Sean McCarthy is going to be a couple of years from now maybe totally different as far as like uh you know absorbing different things and uh you know yeah i mean like my politics have changed a lot just since trump got elected i was much more of a standard democrat and then trump wins and you go well the system's pretty clearly not working if donald trump wins an election <laughs> So I reevaluated a lot of things in the last four years and uh, even in the last couple of years. So I think I'll, you know, I keep reading and I keep learning and I'm not afraid to change my mind. And then in terms of stuff I want to do, you know, as long as I don't drop dead, I'd like to release a stand up special and maybe I'll write a book or some nonfiction thing at some point and keep making podcasts. So, I mean, the hope is this is just the beginning. Hell yeah. And yeah. I love your photo, by the way, on Twitter, because it was so easy to turn it into a thumbnail. All I had to do was find a high res version and then crop out the background and just duplicate it because it's just like one pattern. I love yeah. having easy jobs like that to do. So, Sean, please follow Sean P. McCarthy at SeanMcCarthy.com and also Grub Stakers podcast, one of my favorite podcasts right now. I've been listening oh, to it, and I highly recommend everybody to listen to it for the visuals as well. If you want to see people groping bulls' balls on a regular basis, this is definitely the podcast for you, and your uh, co-host uh, Yogi is great, and uh, it's just, it is very important to go out and analyze all these different things, and I would love to keep messaging with you, Sean, about Israel behind the scenes. Send me all yes. you got. I want to I wanna go through this. I yeah. We're going to shy away from that. So anyway, guys, thank you oh. so much. Thank you so much for watching this. I appreciate each and every single one of you. We are going to have Jonathan Peugeot. Jonathan Peugeot this Thursday. This is a very, very interesting event. I'm very excited to talk to him about iconography and symbolism and all that stuff. So it's going to be a blast. I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to totally and challenge him on modern art. That'll be my Hell answer. yeah. So yeah. anyway, guys, this is the end of the show. I am closing this thing right now. Oh, patreon.com slash break the rules. If you guys are not patrons, I don't know what you're doing. We recently got a new $5 patron today. What do you get? You get exclusive behind the scenes. Uh, what am I saying? No, you get you get exclusive streams that are patron only for your eyes only at uh, the first tier, for the five dollar tier only. for Julie's eyes only. And then for and you also get our Discord, which if you, if you have not joined it, I'm gonna link it up here as well. Our Discord link, and you get a private area in the Discord for patrons only. Twenty dollar tier is gonna bring you. Look at this, like Sean. What do you think of this? What do you think of this uh, wooden piece over here? Look at that. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. It's, Thank you. Uh, my fa did he carve that for the hit HBO series Game of Thrones? I know. It does kind of look like that, doesn't it? No, my father created this, and this is definitely legit. This is the definitely legit magnet. If you don't know who definitely legit is, you should. He is a beautiful collie dog slash oh. man, and uh, this is the definitely On legit Twitter. magnet. Yes, on Friend Twitter. Of the show. Mm -hmm. Friend of the show. So anyway, uh, twenty dollars is going to give you a magnet, and uh, thirty dollars out of wood, and uh, thirty dollars Geo's beautiful print, which I'm just going to play over here for all the people who are watching on YouTube to see him in action. And uh, Sean, if you haven't seen Geo's art, I highly recommend that I'll I'll send you the links. Geo is a beautiful man and a beautiful uh, <laughs> w w work of artist. <laughs> Art workist. So anyway, <laughs> art workist. And fifty dollar patrons gives you all of the above plus a custom magnet. Whatever you want, my father is going to design a custom magnet for you. And this is a yearly thing. By the way, all the magnets are yearly. You're gonna keep getting a magnet every year as long as you stay as a patron. You are also going to get a uh, beautifully painted uh, Warhammer 40k figure from Jules P. Hamilton. You are also going to get another beautiful painting from Geo. We've got them on the way for our fifty dollar new fifty dollar patron eight eight eight. So I'm very excited uh, about his reaction to all that stuff. And uh, you are also going to get oh i completely forgot to say you're also going to get first dibs on the mp3 episodes of all the streams that we have this is regardless of whichever patron that you choose and you are also going to get as a 50 dollar patron any custom if you want to any custom printout of any of the uh logos so for if you the, want to uh, post your sean mccarthy 
then well then, no uh, that that's a photo though i mean like if sean McCart mccarthy was painted if my father were to uh, paint sean mccarthy oh, then yeah, that yeah. would be something that you can uh, that you can get so anyway guys this is the end of the stream patreon.com oh, awesome slash... sean sean do oh you have uh, of patreon course tiers? yes yes what, what do you Let's get when you here. subscribe to your podcast uh so for five dollars a month you get the extra episode and then for more than that you get to feel good about yourself you get to feel like you're breaking against that we're, we're trying to add we're gonna get some merch and stuff we're just like you know we're like we're busy but we're also lazy but we are going to this year now that covid's over we're gonna add more more tears let me plug sean so if you guys are interested in seeing sean uh, my goal is to work out a deal so that he can come to Childerberg Four, yes, uh, also known as Childerberg Veer, because we always do a different language for the number. Um, so if uh, we can get Sean out here to Texas, uh, we will be having uh, Sean come and do a great stand-up set. He will probably be joined by Robbie the Fire Burns scene. All right, um, Brian Breckenridge, who is a great comedian here in DFW. And uh, hopefully Kyle Ruff, who's a great comedian out of uh, out of Fort, uh, well, no, out of uh, you know I don't remember the city, but it's Colorado. So uh, if if any of you guys are interested in following, we're gonna try to get him out here. We Childeberg is really really a lot of fun. It's uh, about two hundred to three hundred libertarians of all different stripes. Some of them uh, anarchists, some of them you know status, some of them uh you know mutualists a lot of different types of libertarians so we'll, we're gonna have them all out there and it's it's just a total a, a fun time everybody's is doing great we just we just finished up this year's last week um so it will be next year also uh ron paul day is um the 21st of august so if you are in the dfw area come to grapevine lake uh follow me at chillerberg.com i'll tell you which uh which uh you know, park area or whatever. We do Ron Paul day every year so that you guys can come cook out with us and enjoy just um, anti-imperialist sentiment with uh, people that uh, are just chill and just like to swim in the lake and have a good time. So uh, hit me up on Childerberg uh, on Twitter or uh, at Tasting Anarchy on uh, Gmail. So Tasting Anarchy at gmail.com. Excellent. Oh, and he has that, a day now. Amazing. Yes. <laughs> And with that, I shall bid everybody adieu. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't We're all forget Sean our... out by now. Huh? And yeah. Don't forget, <laughs> yes, don't forget to uh, check out uh, the stream on Thursday, Jonathan Peugeot. That is coming up. And with that, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Sean, so very much. I really enjoyed uh, talking, thank and you. this was a wonderful stream. Thank you guys yeah. so much. This, Take care. this was great. Thank.